everyone. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy there are very few empty chairs because it looks like you do understand that the work culture is that ecosystem that makes things happen. You have heard this morning Stephen Van Roy talking about the ecosystem for innovation, the culture for innovation, in, and the culture is also what keeps us here and focus on what we got to do. I'm Gabriella Vacca, and I have two, two roles at, uh, at Sky. One is I'm the CTO for Sky Italia. The second one is I'm the group director for the enterprise technology services. So in the second role, I really get to work with the people, like Abby, that I'm going to introduce later, to, to help the culture and, of course, all the technologies that make, that make an enterprise happen. Uh, I'm not going to tell you my, you know, they, they asked me, well, why don't you give you a little bit more background about yourself and what you did? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you why I'm here now and why I'm excited. I have uh, two pillars in my personal and, uh, and leadership traits profile. One is technology. The second is uh, people. Technology is what Stephen said. Technology is enabled value for people and for organization. But I'll give you a little story on why, why I came to that, to that point really early in my life, and honestly, before even knowing what technology was. So I have an Italian accent, right? I grew up in Italy. And I grew up in a small farmer community in the northern of Italy. My dad used to sell agricultural machines, so tractors and, and so forth. And one time he asked me, I was probably six or seven, and he asked me, Gabriel, do you want to come with me and we're going to test a new tractor? So I said, of course, yes. But when we got there, he asked me, do you want to drive the tractor? And I was six or seven, and immediately I said, yes, but I had no idea how to do it, right? And I couldn't even reach the pedals of this big agricultural machine. But I was sitting on his lap, and I was driving this tractor. And I still remember the feeling I got at that point. I was feeling safe because I was on my, on my dad's lap, open field in front of me. And, and the only thing I, I, I had in my head, I can do it. I am a six seven years old girl and I can do it and I am a girl and I am a girl so that feeling of what uh, technology I didn't know it was called technology I didn't know it was called machines I didn't know anything about it but I have this this feeling of something enabling enabling me to do something that I've never imagined now translate that to people right Translate that to perhaps what is more in my DNA, you know, the moment I realized that empathy needed to be moved into, you know, emotional intelligence and, and, and so forth. And this is why I'm here today. By the way, if you think it's easy for someone that was trained as a technologist to come here and talk to you about the technology and people, you are wrong. So because I work on that for 20 years to build my confidence, I do need a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. So this is, uh, this is your first practice in terms of applause. You're going to have two others, <laughs> right? So this was just to get you there. But um, today we're going to talk about uh, the work culture, how it's being challenged by hybrid. And uh, we have uh, one real expert here with us who is who I, I, I have the honor of introducing him. I read his first book. Um, he is a bestseller author. He wrote two books, Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat, and then a second one, which you have, which talks about resiliency and fortitude, resiliency pers on the personal level, organizational level. But before that, he was a senior technologist at Twitter and uh, at uh, YouTube. So he made that change. He gave, a, he gave a voice to the unspoken reality of the importance of work culture. 
which is, should be the number one, the number one focus that all of us as, as a leader in the industry needs to have. Please, now I actually am gonna ask you another little exercise. I, I like to, you know, to do that. I want you to imagine when you were 15 years old and you went to your first concert and you had the, you were about to see the greatest celebrity, the greatest band rock that you ever imagined. So that was the round of applause that I want for Bruce. Okay. okay. So the first thing I came, uh, um, I thought when, uh, I read your book and I read your profile and I learned about you in social media is what were you thinking? I mean, you were a senior executive in these cool companies and uh, you let that go, you let the career go to give a voice to this uh, unspoken reality of uh, work culture. What was your spark? Um, thank, you. thank you for the introduction, by the way. Uh, yeah, I, I've always had like this curiosity about workplace culture. Um, if anyone, and it happens less now, it's really interesting, but if anyone had to work their way through college or if anyone sort of uh, did bar work or I, I started off doing fast food restaurant work and bar work and you used to learn very quickly when you went to those organisations whether you were going to have a good time working there or not. Like from, day, the, from the first session you do in a restaurant or a bar, you know whether it's going to be good energy working there. And, and actually, a lot of that transfers through to dealing with customers as well. You can tell it's just going to be a nice place to work. And what struck me when I first started my career, what struck me was how transferable that was. That happened in offices as well. Um, and I worked at a couple of places with really good cultures. And so I became really transfixed, fascinated. In fact, I got the opportunity to go and work at Google. And like everyone, I'd sort of gone online and I'd searched best places to work and Google seems to come out the top result on the search engine for that one. And so, um, and so I was sort of struck myself, oh, okay, I, you know, well, I've got the chance. I felt, genuinely, I felt like I've always been interested in this. It's like I'm going to the chocolate factory and Charlie and the chocolate factory. I'm, I'm going in to see how it works. And, um, and, you know, Google used to do something. They used to talk about, you know, the fascination that we've all got right now. Can work be done differently? I think that's the interesting thing that everyone's wrestling with right now. Can you do it differently and get better results? And Google used to talk about this thing, 70, 20, 10. I don't know if you remember this. It was so significant in terms of the legend that they established. It was in their S1, in, in their IPO document. And they used to talk about 70% of your time would be on your main job. 20% of your time would be on a project. 10% of your time could be on a project you didn't even have to tell anyone. It could be your secret project. It's like exciting, a secret project. Uh, anyway, when I got to Google, I'll, I'll not deny, I, I waited till I passed my probation before I started asking questions. So I sort of d done my uh, few months, you know, making sure my job was secure. But I noticed that so many people were asking about it externally and no one internally was talking about it. Eventually, I tracked down an engineer and uh, an engineer, I said, what are you doing on your 20% time? What are you doing on your 10% time? And he laughed. He was like, ha, 20% time. Yeah, yeah. That's what we call Saturday. <laughs> and, um, and it just struck me that, oh, wow, okay. Quite often firms try to pretend to you that they've worked out that the world of work is different there and it's exactly the same. And, but that question still hangs in the air for me. Can you do things differently and get better results? And I think that's the really exciting challenge of the moment we're in right now. Can you find a way to do things differently where it feels more engaged, it feels more productive, and yet it's done in a different way, and I think that's the challenge of the moment. And, and this is so relevant today because uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, we were hit by the pandemic. We all survived. We all found a way to work differently and get things done. Right? So that's one certainly one element that maybe we need to, I mean, we need to, we need to discuss because we have learned how to work differently. But if you step back a second, and in your first book you talk about the two mega trends, which I love. By the way, I love the way you, you write. And I can see that you are an engineer because the book is <laughs> very nice structure, so I can remember it, right? It's wonderful. Um, but you talk about one mega trend, which is the how do we, you know, this, this, this um, 
dream that we had about you can you can work anywhere anywhere anytime and I was working in mobility at that time so for me it was wow people are going to be free free of working anywhere yes fast forward it and now you get a workforce which is totally stressed out because they feel that they need to work all the time and sometimes so some employers think that people need to be connected all the time so one dangerous path the second one is uh, with uh, artificial intelligence and automation. You know, the promise is that all trivial tasks in our life will be reduced. So here we are with uh, connected all the time. I need to be at my best all the time. And by the way, the global environment, right, war, energy crisis, and so forth, plus COVID, wow, that's a lot to handle. So is there, is there um, are we doomed? <laughs> <laughs> the really interesting thing is, is that if you'd applied for a job three years ago, it, there were so many fixed elements of that job that you didn't even question. You didn't even question how many days a week it was. You didn't even question how many, uh, how many the hours you were meant to be at the office. If someone didn't tell you when you accepted a job, you'd turn up at the office at 9 o'clock on Monday. And you'd, you'd expect to work till 5.30, 6 o'clock on, on Friday. Um, and it's so intriguing now that those things have changed. And it's, 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 I think, you know, the, we're, we're definitely in a zone right now where we're witnessing a few organisations, um, largely led by the leadership, questioning whether we've made a big mistake. And so, you know, we're in a zone where... I mentioned before technology firms are quite keen to pretend to you that they've got all the answers. It's part of marketing. You know, when, when I worked at technology firms, quite often the architecture of the way that buildings are created is to get your phone out of your pocket to take a photograph. Because if you can photograph a slide coming down the middle of a building or if you can photograph a meeting room that looks like the Death Star, then immediately you're telling all of your friends you won't believe how good it is to work here. It's just staging. It's just... Uh, it's, it's just a sort of marketing device. But, um, and those tech firms are actually really interesting at the centre of the movement to try and force people back to the office. Apple, we imagine as like this really sort of um, ins inspirational, liberated organisation, and yet they're demanding three days a week back in the office. Google's demanding three days a week right. in the office. So we're at this really interesting moment where, you know, I'm not sure we're doomed, but <laughs> the, the fundamentals of how work is evolving are still taking shape um, and the really interesting thing as a result is you used to go to a, an old, a, a website like, like Glassdoor number one thing that um, so Glassdoor is a website where you can rate your employer or you can give them a sort of an assessment and you know broadly what we were judging before was applications of the same monoculture right every organization had broadly the same working conditions For the first time I think we're going to get people going there and, and saying their experience and how different it is. But the number one thing people say on Glassdoor is the workplace culture is more important for them than salary or, or the, the terms of employment. So it gives you a good indication that the way we spend those 40 hours a week working still has a bearing on what our lived experience of our, of our lives are. So I think you know there's so many of these questions right. that are up in the air, and I'm not convinced that any firms have got the right to say they've got the answer. But the good news is uh, that today, leaders, I mean, you, you heard the Stephen earlier, right? They talk about it. Mm. In the past, they didn't. And I felt uh, um, a little bit of a piece of, an odd piece of furniture because I, even earlier in, in, my, um, in my career, I was, I was, you know, I was focused on creating the right the culture for people. Perhaps because, as I, as I told you earlier, is I grew up in an agricultural community, and my first uh, coach was my, grandpa, my, my grandfather, Nonno Carlino. And uh, Nonno Carlino had the chickens, and they, he was keeping his chicken really clean and said, why do you keep on cleaning? You know, he's wasting time. Chicken are messy. And he said, well, chick, happy chicken makes good eggs. <laughs> and I said, huh? You know, so translate that is that the culture is that is that why people are now talking about it and we are debating two days a week, three days a week, uh, remote working. Is it because we understood the, the value of having that ecosystem? 
it's it's so fascinating. I, I, I get get sort of lost in um, imagining as, you, as you're tell, telling that. The really interesting thing is that you know. So I said the number one thing that people say matters to them is the workplace culture, and you, that might be changing. That may well be changing. We may well be drifting apart from our work as part of our identity in the way that it was before. But the number one predictor of whether you think you've got a good job or whether you're engaged with your job is whether you've got a best friend at work. It's actually something far softer than you might imagine. For all the strategy that the leader might stand up and share, for all the PowerPoint slides beautifully prepared, the number one predictor of whether you feel connected to that is whether you've got a best friend at work. And the interesting thing about the way work is evolving and the reason why we are becoming slightly more detached from work is that the number of people who report having a best friend at work for hybrid workers is 17%. That's, the, that's like a third of what it used to be. So people aren't necessarily seeing work as a source of friendship in the way that they saw before. To some extent, it's like this evolution from the relationship that we used to have with school to the relationship we have with college. So if you sort of indulge me on that a second. At school, it was this really connected uh, sort of this um, very energetic environment where if you missed a day at school, you felt like you'd missed out. There's, you know, your best friends were the people you went to school with. When you went to college, quite often the people you, who were on your course weren't your best friends. They were people that you'd maybe see, but you didn't generally socialise with them on the Friday or Saturday night. We, and you had a connection with them, you had a relationship with them, but it was at arm's length. And, you know, way, at college, you didn't have to necessarily do your work from nine o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the afternoon. You could pick and choose when you did it. And I think we are moving to something closer to our relationship with college. Now, whether that means that for most organisations, people don't feel the same connection. Maybe the, these quit rates, these resignation rates we're witnessing are just a new fact of life because we don't feel as attached. But it does beg the question, um, without forcing work to be our identity, can some organisations create something that feels like a, a tighter bond, provide some of that friendship and connection that maybe we did benefit from in the past? I have a, um, I have a theory. <laughs> I can't prevent myself from noticing that talking about the culture for organisation goes along with uh, the new awareness that we have about diversity and inclusion, even Stephen mentioned it, and uh, the fact that we needed more women in the workplace. Is that a fact? Is it, uh, uh, is it true? This, this, this normal evolution of those two elements, or you think they are independent? Well, it's really interesting. Um, I did some analysis last year um, with someone in Australia. Now, Australia had a very weird COVID in the sense that at the start of COVID, you might remember that there were news clips of them going to sporting events and concerts. It felt like they were rubbing the, our noses in it as they went around normal life. And yet Australia ended up having, by the end of COVID, having more days in lockdown than pretty much any country in the world. But in the midst of all of that, a year, about a year in, they returned to the office. And um, someone contacted me anonymously with some some data from Australia. Now, Australia in Australia, you have to publish your gender diversity at the every layer of your organisation, and which gives you a really rich uh, seam of data. And what we were able to do was correlate the the gender balance of organisations, and then match it alongside their return to work policies. And it was astonishing. If you don't think the return to the office has a diversity and inclusion element to it, then this data swept any doubts away. The more gender balanced an organisation, or the more women there were in an organisation, in se senior roles, in, in middle management roles, across the organisation, the more likely they were to introduce flexibility. But it goes further than that. There was some analysis in the US um, looking at the racial element of, of this. And what, um, what was discovered was that um, there was a very high increase, about four times more likely for people from, uh, from African-American backgrounds to want to continue working remotely. And principally the reason was is they reported um, low, consistent levels of day-to-day -day microaggressions. They reported that when they were in the office, people would make a comment on their hair. People would make a comment about 
them ascribing them with being uh, having emotions that they weren't having and they just found that it was exhausting something that they didn't have to deal with them when they were working remotely so if, if you're in any doubt any organization that claims to have a diversity and inclusion agenda and yet is trying to enforce a five or four day week return to the office to some extent they're missing they're they're trying to mislead you i think probably the, the best way to say it get it now we are going to, um, I'm going to ask uh, Abby to join us. Abby is uh, a great uh, business partner of mine, I have to say. She is uh, the group director for uh, the strategic workforce planning. She is the one who is making the culture happen, right? Abby, come on. I remember that Abby and I met during uh, um, when I, I we both joined in uh, you know for me it was uh, late uh, 2019 uh, she joined in the beginning of 2020 but we met when we were defining we were in the middle of COVID and we we tried to figure out what to do for our people um, how to survive and 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 so forth so. I wanted to ask you two questions. One is, what does your team does to make the culture happen for all of us at Sky? And then the second is, just give us, while you talk through it, just give us some example on uh, how we made it, I would say, and which element perhaps uh, are element that needs to carry on to the Sky of the future. Yeah, sure. So my team, great team, we look at people like Bruce and we look at external insights, we look at what the future might be, we look at our business strategy really importantly, and then we think about internally, how do we develop the culture, our ways of working, our organisation, partnering with brilliant people like Gabriella in tech to bring all of those ingredients together to make sure it's a brilliant place to work and we can achieve what we need to as a business. And what I would say is it's a journey, isn't it, right? You know, we don't have all the answers. We test and learn. We listen to our people and we evolve and adapt. I think Stephen talked earlier about it being an adaptive organisation. And that's critical because we've got to keep evolving as the world. This crazy world we live in um, adapts as well. And Gabrielle, as you say, it was particularly crazy when we were both working together. Indeed. And it almost feels like a different world, doesn't it, when we look back into those um, COVID days when the first lockdown was hitting and like every organisation, we mobilised really quickly to get people the tech, the chairs, all the practical things they needed to work from home. And we did that super fast. And then also all the emotional support. And I'm not you know, ashamed to talk about emotions in a business environment. You know, how do we help our managers really lead their people well? How do we give people the flexibility to manage their you know, homeschooling? No one wants to go back to that, do they? You know, the homeschooling, their kids, all the other pressures on life. So how do we put support our people as people, as well as giving them all of the practical tools that they need to survive? And it's that human values aspect that I think is really important in Sky and helps our people thrive. It's true. And a lot of companies, a lot of people that I talk with in the industry, it looks like uh, um, there were two principles that were put in place right away. The first is that every company trusted, obviously, the regulations because we, they immediately realized we were in a global crisis, right? So that's good. The second is that they talked with people. They constantly talked, and there are tons of communication coming from the top. Uh, you know, a new, a new sense of, uh, you know, if I have a meeting with you online, of course, I'm going to ask you, how are you doing? Because that's what makes us closer as, as people. Um, Bruce, I have a question for you. One of the, um, call it dilemma, that, that, that we have is this, uh, what I call the me, we, us culture, right? So the me is simple. It's all about me. I need to be productive at work. I need to have the technology that works and so forth. The we is, uh, is my team, so the people I can name, right, that, that I work with. And so, of course, I want to have the right tools uh, to be effective with them. But what about the us culture, right? So what the company does together, how that in this me, we, us culture, what is the, what is the challenge that hybrid can, can give us? You think, touch a little bit in your yeah. first book. I think, I think you raise a really important issue. What you generally find 
And this goes to a, a big level. I was chatting to someone who works for the United Nations, and he said the first thing we do when we're setting about writing a plan for a developing country is ask, is there a sense of social cohesion? Is there a sense of, like, us that we feel like together? And actually, COVID was really good for it. What, what you found was when there was a sense, and some countries had this really palpably, uh, when you've got a sense that we're all in it together, that us, um, it's protective. You know, in fact, you, one of the things you might say is the reason why we've got a new prime minister yesterday is because when someone shifts from looking like one of us to looking like one of them, you know, in a really simplistic way, it often is the undoing of, of, of an individual. And so, uh, broadly, what you find, you find that in organisations. When organisations have got a really strong sense that we're all in it together, yeah. it's when the culture hangs together. And, and, you know, witness that thing I said before about having a friend at work is really predictive mm -hmm. of your experience. Uh, you know, these are really soft skills, actually, but that sense that we're all in it together would make you realise that, you know, why so few firms talk about being fully remote. Even the ones who, you know, you can go and work on a mountain somewhere, they talk about themselves being remote first because they will say, oh, we have a big team gathering where we all get together in this place twice a year. Or we have, you know, our department meets once, once every six months in this place because that coming together and feeling connected to other people is very predictive. And this, it's you know, it, it just... It's an important reminder for all of us about the human part of all of this. It's the power of the community. Mm. And uh, um, I'm looking forward to reading your, your second book, because, which you guys have over there. Because it talks about resilience, and I feel that confidence and resilience are the two sisters, right? So confidence is what moves you from you know, an idea to making things happen. Resilience is what gives you the strength to keep on going even when you failed. But the reality is the community, the us, becomes important to carry an organization onward. Mm -hmm. And uh, Abby, you, you are at the center of, you know, call it creating a culture, but it's built on a huge diversity of culture. We have, uh, we have Germany, we have Italy, we have the UK, we have India, we have, uh, you know, United States right now. So profoundly cultural different, mm -hmm. um, you know, companies and, and locations. Then you have, of course, uh, you know, content, technology, product, business. So the us must be very complex to, to achieve. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and that's partly why Sky is such a fascinating place, right? Um, so Dana is really passionate about this, and she talks about culture, community, innovation, and learning. And they're the four aspects that we really think about when we think about how we're building the culture, how we're building our teams. Um, and they're all really important, particularly the learning aspect. And Sky is an organization I've always found is very generous in how we learn. Um, it's got a real apprenticeship culture. And coming together in person is important to help that learning, which then feeds that innovation, uh, which is the culture and the community. And what we've tried to do is not be too prescriptive because we've got such a diverse workforce that what would work for our contact centre colleague would work for people in marketing, would work for people in tech, would work for people in product. It's such a different organisation that we've really tried to think about what's the purpose of the work you're doing. So if you're in tech and you're working on a, I don't know, a retrospective or something, you know, that might be great to come together and do that in person. But if you need some really heads down thinking time, you're probably better off doing that at home. If you're in a contact centre environment, it's different again. If you're an engineer, you're out on the road, you're not even in the office. So we've really tried to tailor our thinking to what's the purpose of that work and then try and trust our people to do the right thing with their leaders. Great, great, great. Um, I have one more question for you, Bruce, which is I, when I was reading your book, which of course you all have to read, right? Um, I mentally compared it to, to another great book that I read um, a few years back that was Hit Refresh by the CEO of Microsoft, Satya, right? And it always struck me how the Hit Refresh created a culture that was, it seems to be really driven by his, uh, his passion for the company, his, his, his personal journey and so forth. It was a little, I call it top down, right? While in your book, you talk about a culture that is almost created by all of us together. Yes, leadership has a responsibility, but each one of us 
has a responsibility to create uh, this culture. So it's more, I call it bottom up. What are your thoughts on uh, top down, uh, bottom up, uh, lateral? What, what, how, yeah. Any any advice? Yeah. Uh, any advice for us? It shows how complicated it is. I guess you know what I. Um, really strongly believe is that we all are contributors to a culture that now Microsoft's really interesting because they went from Steve Ballmer who's like the most bombastic uh, if you've if you've ever got something where you want to laugh for 10 minutes watch uh, YouTube Steve Ballmer and remind yourself of his entrances of conferences it's like you couldn't it, it was the the alpha males alpha males like this sweaty bald guy running onto stage and whooping um, and in contrast, Satya Nadella is this incredibly introverted, humble person. The interesting articulation of that is that the Microsoft set about under that uh, new change of leadership. They said, we want to be far more humble. And so we want all of the deals we do to be, to be where the customer wins. And, you know, even to the extent that maybe it's 51%, 49%. And so as a result of that, you know, um, Netflix have just given them a big contract to sell their advertising. And it's just an interesting example of uh, they were perceived as a less cutthroat competitor. So those things clearly do play a part throughout the whole of the, the strategy of the organization. Um, but, you know, it goes, to, I think my feeling strongly is that we all do contribute to culture, even if the leaders might set the weather for it. And uh, one specific advice to us as leader, just just one, right? If you start doing this differently with your team tomorrow, and you know that in uh, in uh, you know I can guarantee there is going to be there is going to be a result, what would that be? Um, well, firstly, you know, normally culture exists at a team level rather than a company level. So we've all got the opportunity. So it's the we. Yeah, we've all got the opportunity to create something that's specific to us. I, I was really struck by a phrase that the, the former chief rabbi of the UK used. And it's, I, I, I mentioned it merely because it's a sort of quite a philosophical point. And he talked about, I don't speak Hebrew, so I probably pronounce this wrong. He talks about this word simha that appears in the Old Testament. And he said this word is translated as joy, but it means shared joy. It's sort of a participle of we, I think. And he says, anytime you think about moments that define a group, define, you know, are definitive, they, they are memorable moments, they've normally got shared joy as part of them. And it's a really interesting thing where you sit, sit back and you think at the end of a year or maybe the end of a project, what defines your memory to that project is the moments where you felt this togetherness. It might have been a team dinner. It might have been a team event where you all got together and you laughed at something. And thinking about those moments of shared joy as a leader are probably the sort of things that strategically on a plan don't sit at the top of the plan. But in terms of the experience of people are the things that define the experience. I guarantee if you think about your favourite ever job, if you, if you cast your mind back maybe to the first job that meant something to you, you'll remember these moments of simha. You'll remember moments where you laughed with people, moments where there was just an incredible energy in the room. Th those are the things that stay with us. And I think, I think it's often it's a tactical thing. Thinking about how this meeting to set something up is going to go feels like a, a, a casual detail at the end of the plan rather than the thing that will define people's experience of it. And I think that's the thing I would say. Is when we come is is when we connect as humans, right? Mm. That that joy, share joy mm. starts, and that gives you an emotion to remember. Love it, love it. Um, we have one uh, one question from the audience, and the question is specifically on something that unfortunately is touching all of that, all of us, which is the cost of living, right? In uh, it's a crisis. And it's going to impact the way we going to impact the way we work. It's going to impact hybrid. How do you, you know, what do you think about it? Home, office, cost of living, energy. Um, any, any, any thought? Any what is Kai planning to do? What is, uh, what is, what are you hearing from from uh, other other companies and how they are? addressing as much as possible that problem yeah i'd say you know quite rightly it's the very top thing on our agenda at the moment um, and how we we best support our people and our customers as well so if i take you know our people first we announced um 
yesterday we're going to make a couple of one-off payments to support um, our, not all of our colleagues, but you know our, our colleagues that need it, so a big proportion of our colleagues, um, to help them with their bills. And then we're also thinking really practically as we get into winter about is there you know support that we need to do in terms of transport or office or food or how can we help people you know get through this really difficult time you know sky is a good employer um, we're a really strong employer and that's important for people's certainty and then uh, what are the practical things we can do to help people through this um, and that balance of you know the office being there and available for people it's a, it's a good safe warm space and then also that flexibility thinking about you know travel costs as well and um, so for people really important then for our customers you know we have social tariffs we're thinking a lot about the value that we can offer you know, Sky is a really important product for people. You know, we've got to recognise um, that people are making really tough choices in terms of their um, discretionary spend at the moment. So, how do we make sure that we give the best value possible to our customers? So, yeah, really tough. Bruce, Bruce do you have any? Yeah, I mean, the, the hard thing to navigate on it is that it seems to be changing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So, that's you know, true. It's a moving target. I don't think any of us really are able to fully visualise what is coming down the road to us. You know, it's, it's going to be really interesting how it potentially changes maybe the relationship we've got with the office, where people are going to the office because it's warmer or because um, for a lot of people that's a really unfortunate choice that they might be presented with spending 10, 20 pounds getting to the office. And so it's not necessarily an economy that they can easily take advantage of. But I think, you know, the, the challenge is going to be that I think the uncertainty and the the, the impact it's going to have is probably far bigger than any of us are, are prepared for right now. Um, one, uh, one, one point, I have another question from the audience, which is quite interesting and, and, and connects with some of the innovation we saw earlier. So how can we create a culture of we as in a virtual world? Does the lack of human interaction make it harder? Or I would add, you know, are those new technologies, the metaverse that we saw earlier, can help, or is it a challenge? Is a, is, is a challenge or is an enhancer? Could it be a solution for this lack of human touch that we may have in the virtual world? I'd love to hear what you thought. <laughs> you, you seem like someone who really cares about these things. I what do, do I do. Um, I, I think that we'll need a little bit of both. I think that uh, the, the, the metaverse, the meeting in the virtual space, uh, it, it opens your imagination. It, it is an equalizer in terms of locations, because we are all the same. Maybe we're all represented by an avatar, and I love that. I can be in India, I can be in the US, and, and so forth. So to me, we do need a little bit of that. But I also am a believer that uh, the, the shared joy is what you remember. So it's, uh, I think we need, uh, we always need a little bit of both. Um, what do you think? And now you cannot say yeah. what I said. Yeah. So you're, um, you're in trouble. Thank yeah, you I mean, for asking me that question first. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I worked for a long time in social media and, and, you know, the question that occasionally gets asked is, can you build strong communities of people who don't necessarily see each other every day? And most emphatically you can, although it's really interesting um, Meetup culture has become a big thing that's been spawned by digital connections, people yeah. meeting in real life, wanting to, to sort of recognise each other in, in flesh and blood. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think personal connection seems to play a big part. And there's, the cues for it are often really trivial. Laughing with each other is mm. far more likely to happen when you're in the room together than when you're on a Zoom call together. Sure. And it seems to just produce some endorphin related connection that you can't read a bullet point and activate the same so there seems to be something human about being around other people that does produce a stronger level of bonding abby what do you think i mean we we when you are in this campus and you have a, such an immersive experience it's easier right but when you have locations that are you know india italy germany and 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 so forth what are what are your thoughts yeah yeah, I agree with you. I think you need both. You know, there's nothing like laughing in person with somebody. And also when you're, you know, spotting if your team member or your colleague or your, your friend is okay. You know, having those body language cues is critical. Um, and then thinking about working multinationally, which we do. You know, we have sites in India, in Italy, in Germany, all over the world. 
actually what some of the feedback we had was um, when we're together on a screen and we're all the same size square, there's something really leveling about that and the communication and the sense of equality from all of our teams was really important. So one of the things we've been thinking quite hard about with Gabriella's support is how do we keep that when we're in hybrid meetings and make sure that it isn't all the people in the UK in the room and the person in Italy, often you, Gabriella, on the screen, that isn't feeling like they've got an equal yeah. share of voice. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, I wanted to thank you and thank both of you. As a reminder, Bruce is going to be outside signing the book. Read it. It's fascinating. It's important for all of us. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, if the speakers can make their way outside and if you're staying for the next session, feel free to sit down. But if you're going to another session, then please make your way to the next one.
Hi, my name is Vishali Nayak. I work as head of software engineering and digital technology. As a child, I always loved maths and uh, problem solving. So technology was a natural choice for me. So I feel pleased to be a part of an industry that makes all the innovative ideas a reality. I started at Sky in 2011 as a software engineer. After a few years as a software engineer, I moved into management roles. Uh, I've done seven different roles at Sky, um, software engineer, technical analyst, uh, delivery manager, and currently as a head of software engineering. So it has been a really rewarding journey, uh, working for different areas within Sky, uh, like content platforms, uh, global OTT, and more recently, industry technology. So I think um, what I've learned at Sky is there's lots of opportunities. Um, you just have to go and seize it. I lead uh, teams in uh, digital service. Our ambition is to make awesome digital uh, customer experience, and uh, my teams uh, play a huge role in that. While Sky is dynamic and fast-paced, it's also very collaborative and inclusive. It's, it's fun working at Sky. Um, there's always new ideas, new opportunities uh, that you can try out. Uh, personally, from a career progression perspective, um, I've been able to try out many different roles and grow as an engineer, grow as a person, and I'm constantly learning all the time. Sky's vision is creating an awesome digital experience for our customers, and I'm really excited to be a part of that vision. Uh, my teams will work on, on this ambition and make it a reality. Uh, Sky's um, value of believing in better is, is something we always strive uh, every day. I'm the chair of the Tech Women Committee at Sky. Our aim is to build a supportive community for women in technology, product and data and other areas uh, of Sky. We have a group of uh, passionate women and male allies who help us build a supportive community and create initiatives to attract, progress and retain female talent. I think we have a long way uh, in getting women into technology. Uh, we have just started in this journey and technology is also not the first choice for young girls. So there's a lot to do in that area as well. Uh, so in Tech Women, we focus on inspiring the next generation. So we recently had our uh, Women in Engineering Day and the theme that we chose was inspiring the next generation. So we had uh, school girls coming in, giving them an experience of what does it mean to work in technology and giving them a real idea of what it means to work in technology. Technology doesn't always mean coding. There are many other different roles in technology. So there's many different opportunities and avenues that women can actually try out. So it's, there's nothing to be scared of. And also showing that there are so many women already working here and we are really thriving and, and supporting each other in um, getting more talent into technology. musical introduction and uh, welcome everyone this morning's late morning session uh, we're not going to talk really about much about technology in this one but really is about people and collaboration how do we actually innovate at sky and how do we do this working together internally of course but also with partners outside with startups and businesses that help us delivering uh, this innovation going forward. first of all I introduce myself before introducing the my colleagues and friends that will uh, help me in this session my name is Andrea Zappia. I'm the CEO and EVP for uh, new businesses and new markets. Uh, I have a really fun job at Sky, uh, and uh, after having been the CEO of Sky Italia for many years, uh, I've now taken the, the, the opportunity to try help the company in developing its ne ne next leg of growth. So we, with my teams, we don't work on the next couple of years. We tend to look forward to 2030 and how do we create uh, growth for, the, for Sky or in that time frame. And we do this looking at new markets uh, and we're looking also at new businesses as well. In the new markets, you probably heard about Sky Showtime, uh, which is launching uh, uh, in less than 20 days on the 20th of uh, this month in the Nordics and quickly following to Netherlands and other markets immediately after. It's an exciting joint venture we did with Paramount and it's, uh, it's a startup, but it's a very well-funded startup. Uh, that has the ambition to take Sky and its content uh, across the rest of Europe where we are not 
um, today. At the same time, we are also working on the glass indication, which is expanding uh, the technology we're developing and keep on uh, improving here to the rest of the world. We've done a deal with Foxtel that's going to launch next year. We're closing another big one soon, and uh, we're finding really an exciting uh, appreciation for that. At the same time, we have also been uh, working to launch new business line in our uh, existing markets, uh, and there is one that will uh, come to market very soon that you'll see in which the team, joined the team worked in uh, making an acquisition uh, uh, of a startup that will be underpinning those capabilities. So as, as you see, whether you know, it's something that we create uh, fully internally or something which we do together with others, uh, being able to, to work uh, together, create uh, the right team, the right collaboration is fundamental. Uh, our teams are actually pretty small and without being able to resource internally, or uh, uh, find uh, resources externally, we would never be able to do any of what we are doing or what we're going to do. So today we'll try to, to, to go under the skin of this uh, together with uh, like, uh, my colleagues and friends, uh, Jenny, um, Amer, Jesse, and Andy, if they can join uh, uh, immediately. Uh, briefly introduce them before uh, exchange a few questions with them. Jenny works with me, and uh, we have been working together for now two and a half years, uh, and she is the Sky Group Director of Growth. She identify, nurture, and then uh, accompany um, uh, ideas and partners uh, for our growth uh, uh, ideas going forward. Amir is the Head of Startup Investment and Partnership at Sky. The title says everything. Uh, <laughs> He's also been uh, with us uh, actually only for one year, right? Yeah, coming right? up to a year. And, uh, and uh, he had a great experience before at Centrica uh, and is helping us, and we're going to talk about it later, in changing our approach uh, with the collaboration with startups from which was traditionally about investment into investment and, and actually partnership and creating commercial um, relationship. Uh, Jesse Schiemann, uh, Jesse is the real uh, startup here. Is the, um, I was very curious to understand how you move from Deloitte uh, into creating your own company and uh, with Paper Cup, uh, which we invested a few years ago, is helping taking Sky News uh, around the world uh, uh, with new new languages. And uh, at the end, um, last but not least, the same, uh, Andy. Andy is actually the person who probably worked on more uh, new project transformations, uh, internal startups, if you mm -hmm. want, uh, in the company. It's been, uh, Probably the only one who is nearly as old as me, no? Maybe I'm <laughs> a chunk. Uh, I've been in the company nearly 20 years. Uh, it's only 12, I think. Well, for me, yeah. So, so you, you're going to get there. Um, so thank you for, for, the, to, for you to, to be with us this morning. Jenny, let's start with you. Uh, so t tell us a bit about your role and how do you start when you s look for a, a, a great idea that can drive sky success in the future? So I sit very much in the new businesses part of Andrea's new businesses and new markets world. Um, and that's really about launching new services, new experiences, uh, I guess with two, two key purposes. One is around driving our broader platform ecosystem, um, very much around glass, which hopefully you all have seen in the market, which is very exciting. Um, and related, also looking where we can drive new revenue streams outside of our existing core business. So that's very much taking a starting point of almost what is Sky's secret sauce, I guess. What are our capabilities and our assets that are unique to Sky that are really in our DNA? And how do we apply those to new sectors? Where are the sectors where we can really bring something of unique value? And that's kind of always the starting point. So when, when, when you do this, uh, how would you define uh, an, an innovative environment? Uh, what are you looking for when you look for innovation? So when I'm looking for innovation, um, I think it's, it's basically two things. Normally I have three things, but I'm gonna have two things. Um, one is really, it's really simple, right? It's, one's about openness. So it's really about where, you know, the market that we're in is evolving. Our competitive landscape is evolving. Increasingly we are up against big tech like everybody else in direct competition. And these are incredibly well-funded companies that are very good at placing kind of strategic bets on the you know, chips on the board, um, and they're willing to take risks, and they're willing to, to sometimes fail, but they're willing to take those bets, and they do it They do it at pace. So I think for us, one of our challenges as a very 
large and successful company is how do we continue to evolve our culture in that landscape? And I think the two things for me is really around just an openness to doing things differently, right? We've been very successful in the past, but the world is changing. And if we're going to evolve with it, we've got to, to think in different ways. We've got to embrace new ideas and new ways of working. And I think frequently looking externally is, is a great way to do that. And, and startups in particular um, have you know, a, lot of, a lot of practices that we can really learn from. So it's, it's really embracing that. And the other one, I think, is this idea of just being able to to, you know, to take a calculated risk. So I think Sky has been, again, fundamentally, you know, phenomenally successful, but we do kind of a few really big things, and we do them every few years, and we do them exceptionally well. But again, as we look towards diversifying out our portfolio, um, we've got to, to think about moving into new areas in a different way. We've got to be willing to take more risks. We've got to be willing to fail. Um, and be okay with that. And I think the mantra of fail fast, so we don't try to break stuff, mm -hmm. usually. <laughs> but I do think there's something around being willing to fail and really take the learnings. And sometimes that means you've got to be willing to, to let go of something because maybe it just didn't work, or maybe you pivot, or maybe you come up with a new investment thesis or a new approach. But I think it's just being willing to free yourself to take that risk is, is incredibly important for us as we think about the future. Uh, just before moving to Emer, one, one important thing I think is that uh, Sky, like most of organization, is a changing organization. And what drove us success in the past that doesn't necessarily will drive success in the future, actually probably will not. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, talk about this change now with Emer in a second. But back to what Jenny said, I think one thing I've seen in myself personally is that, I mean, we have been always very good at creating big success, right? And we told ourselves we are good when we put all our effort into one thing and we get that up and then everyone is behind it. Now, the reality is, tr is that with world changing, we have to be much more nimble and able also to take but maybe smaller or bigger risk and accept failure and learn quickly from that. You know, we have been really scared about failure in the past. We don't want to fail at all, but we're really taking much more, uh, uh, I think, well thought risks sometimes today uh, in order to really push a bit the envelope more than in, more than in the past. Now, as, uh, following up on this, Aymar, you have witnessed and driven a change in our approach uh, in partnership, particularly with startups. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, Sky has been pretty active in the kind of innovation startup ecosystems for quite some time. So. You know, we've been a pretty active investor across North America, Europe, and Israel for coming on to a decade. So, you know, we've tr we've we've managed to accumulate quite a tremendous amount of experience and expertise uh, and knowledge in this space. And, you know, having I think our, our approach when we began was to lead with an uh, with, with investment, so taking a minority stake in an early stage company, um, and then really work hard post investment to try and develop those commercial partnerships and and relationships with those organisations which as I'm sure you guys appreciate, comes with a tremendous amount of challenges, difficulties, all sorts of stuff. Um, the shift in our approach now, and what I think we've learned over that time, is that actually a lot of the value um, that we extract both for ourselves but also for our partners is actually the partnership itself and not so much the investment. So you know, not to say that we don't invest and we won't invest, but actually what we want to do is kind of reprioritize our approach and really lead with a kind of partnership conversation and discussion um, and then at a later date, kind of really talk about and invest in companies that we think it makes sense to invest. Um, and I think that thesis is proving true, certainly to what Jenny was talking about in terms of how we think about Sky over the future, as we think about our platform and how we think about expanding that platform. You know, I think partnerships are absolutely key uh, in order to do that, whether it's from a technology perspective, whether it's from a capability that we're missing, um, or if it's entering into a new market that we don't really know too much about, you know, having that symbiotic relationship with early stage companies and startups is, is absolutely crucial. Okay, can you elaborate a bit more on how do we work you know, and how can we help? Uh, maybe some examples, right? Because, I mean, you're talking about really deepening into our own culture and people. Uh, I mean, creating success is not just about the, the tech no, we find, we collaborate, the investment you put is really about how do we allow entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, to find uh, and drive success, and sometimes even, hopefully, in change a bit 
how we operate? Yeah, it's a great question. So I guess, I mean, to, to start with, I mean, what, what do we bring and what, what value can we offer to startups? You know, obviously our scale, I mean, you know, Sky is a really well-respected brand. Um, you know, obviously we have tremendous amounts of customers. Um, we also have the kind of global footprint now sitting within the Comcast family, all of which is, I think, a tremendous asset and very unique to Sky. Um, in terms of some of the, like the more practical things in terms of how we work, um, you know, I think we've had some great successes, but along the way over that kind of decade of, of working with early stage companies, there's also been a tremendous amount of challenges um, and lessons learned, which I think is where a lot of the value sits. Um, and so, you know, a great example of that is one of the companies that we invested in um, based here in the UK, um, who are kind of helping Sky to develop kind of a novel innovative service and proposition, which hopefully will launch soon. Um, it was just tremendously difficult navigating such a complicated business. Um, you know, Sky is vast, it's big, it's complicated, its processes are challenging, um, people change, you know, there's a lot of attrition, people moving around. Um, and so, you know, our team and my team specifically, kind of one really helps to try and navigate that complexity. Um, and I think fundamentally what we want to try and do is break down as many of the barriers as possible, um, you know, whether it's from a process perspective like procurement, um, whether it's data security, um, you know, whatever it might be in terms of just things that are really important and we can't neglect, but really what we want to try and do is just make that as seamless as possible so that it's as easy for these companies to integrate into Sky as possible um, and, and kind of come to market. Mm. Now, just to top on this, I've seen personally experience where uh, actually we didn't do a great job, right? We, 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 we transmit someone that we thought was a great investor trying to incorporate too quickly into Sky and then ended up not really respecting uh, no, their original uh, uh, culture, what they really could, could bring us very effectively. The good bit is that we learn. So uh, more recently, I mean, we have uh, really challenged ourselves the way we do it and give more time and respected more the, 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 the original culture of the startup we were uh, investing in, how to integrate it into, mm -hmm. uh, into Sky. And I think that one of the, 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 the thing I really like about our company is the fact that um, you know, we really try to keep on learning every day on this and, and, and challenging really the way we, we operate. And even today, I mean, Emma mentioned how big it is the, the company with, with now NBC and Comcast, and that's on one side is a great opportunity. At the same is an added complexity to margin to run. Uh, but I mean, that I must say we're doing really great progress in trying to do We find great collaboration. Jen in particular, I mean, works a lot uh, on the other side of the ocean with our colleagues. And, uh, and we're finding a very open-minded approach from both, both sides. Thank you, Emer. Uh, Jesse, uh, paper cup. I mean, no. actually, I still remember, as I'm, amongst the other things, I'm also <laughs> work with, with Sky News and with John Riley and the team there, and it's my passion. Um, you're really helping uh, uh, Sky News to increase its reach in a very efficient way. The first time, you know, already two years ago, when I heard uh, that Spanish Sky News uh, uh, coverage, it was fantastic to hear. Can you tell us more uh, how the relationship is with Sky as you come up to this uh, and how you found yourself working uh, uh, with Sky to be as an experience. Yeah. Uh, first of all, you need to listen to the Italian version and give us feedback then. <laughs> then that will be the real test. Uh, just to give a quick background on what we do. So we, we don't manufacture physical paper cups. Um, <laughs> I, I, enough suppliers reach out to us that I can suggest a few if you do have, <laughs> have a need. Um, what we do is we want to make videos watchable in any language. And we do that by creating, by using AI to create synthetic voices that are specifically made for video. So think AI, dub, AI dubbing effectively. Um, the idea is you take a voice like that you can hear on Amazon Alexa or Google Home, but we've instead created our own voices that are actually suited for video, which means that people would actually want to watch them. Um, and instructional and news content was one of the first forays that we wanted to make into the world of content because you don't have to capture as much emotion, performance, and expressivity as you would have to do in a drama or a comedy. Um, and that's why Sky was always quite enticing for us. And I think, you know, if you, even if you just pause and look at where we are today, we've reached probably over 42 million people in Spanish-speaking countries just by virtue of the content that we've translated. 
Now there's still a lot more to do in how we build up the presence and how you do it more consistently. But even if we step back right now and say 40 million people were, were reached through Sky News in Spanish, that's, that's an accomplishment in its own right. And I, hats off to Sky for being an early adopter because the idea of synthetic voices, the idea of AI, especially in media, people oftentimes run away from uh, and are averse to. So I think that there is definitely this strong appetite that was quite encouraging to see. Um, I think we can even show a video as well just to give people a sense of what it actually looks like and sounds like so you can get a flavor of it. The route is a completely illegal smuggling route. There's no danger from officialdom. Your danger is always from gangs. Había dos muchachas. Una tenía 16 años y la otra 14. Sabían que el viaje era peligroso. Lo que no creo que supieran era cuán peligroso podía resultar. La verdad es que muchas de aquellas chicas podían ser violadas y forzadas a la esclavitud sexual. Y aquello era verdaderamente desgarrador. So, the original version, the English was the original, and then that generated one that you heard, sorry, the Spanish one was actually a generated voice, or a set of generated voices. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, actually, I never asked you, why paper cap the name? Any, any guesses, anyone know why? Tin can game, so it's basically the string that attaches the two cups, the most elementary form of communication. Oh, that's fantastic. I made the first logo on PowerPoint, uh, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not a designer. <laughs> that's very nice. So, so uh, I mean, by the way, it's still amazing every time I, I listen to this, how this is uh, so realistic. And and I, I actually, you said about the emotions, actually the combination with music allows to deliver an emotion mm -hmm. as well. So, so you're achieving that brilliantly. Um, so tell us a bit more uh, your relationship and what do you find uh, that Sky is doing well uh, in collaborating with you, what we should do better also going forward? I think what works well is the, the question at the, the, the willingness at the outset is always open. So we might talk about the idea of saying, hey, if we can ingest some of the Sky News data, it can help train our models. Or maybe we should speak with the, with the team in Germany to look at scripts for Sky Sports that we can figure out how to better accommodate for sports content. Re you, you can come up with 5,000 objections as to why that wouldn't work. And a lot of them are probably legitimate. But what I've, what's been very refreshing consistently across Sky has been, OK, actually, let's figure out what and how we can do this, not what are the main issues that we need to overcome. And for that, I think if you don't ask that, if you don't have that inspiration, that mentality at the outset, you're just doomed to fail and stop. And to be honest, we have to be so selective with who we work with and partner with because it, we, we, just, we can't go s through six month cycles of trying to figure out how to, how to find German scripts for German sports, con for sports content. So I think, Having that initial <coughs> willingness, excitement, and ambition has probably been something that's definitely worth celebrating. Um, in terms of what can function better, it's a good question. Probably, I think, I think where, and maybe this is just by nature of Scott being such a big organization, but knowing how different countries, well, between Italy, Germany, the UK, as well as different departments within those countries, interoperate I think would probably be helpful because sometimes we find ourselves or myself trying to navigate and connect the right dots. Um, I surprisingly have to do that with, I realize probably with most media companies, well most big companies, it's, it's just a function of being just of that sheer size. I think that's probably something that, that we could probably do better on. That's a very good point Jess is raising and it's also partially and some of you uh, know this very well by the, the fact that the way Sky has become a single company. The reality is, you know, the, the, the job of pay TV has been traditionally a very heavy duty work to be done in single geographies, in single countries. So the three skies, uh, I mean, have different uh, um, origins and different, they came to market in different timing. Uh, they also have different uh, shareholder structure up until a short time ago. Uh, and therefore these differences are also part of the I think one of the great value that Sky can bring because the, 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 the roots and the stories, history of, of Italy, Germany, and the UK are very different and they enrich each other, can be an issue sometimes. So we actually have uh, now accelerated this 
this uh, uh, process at the moment we integrated the business much more and we'll do even more so hopefully what this is finding will be less and less but it's it's part of also what has been our strength thank you jesse we come back probably later to some questions from from the audience andy so we've been talking with particularly uh with emmer and jesse about sky and the way we collaborate uh, with uh, in, uh with startups and how we invest or partner with them uh you, you have a different experience you know you, you joined sky 12 years ago uh, you have worked with some of the, our bigger internal startups, uh, from AdSmart to, to Now TV, and now, now we are in the building of Now. Uh, today, uh, you also led a lot of transformation uh, uh, process. As we talk about collaboration and uh, achieving success uh, through joining uh, forces on complex projects, what would you think are the key elements you look for to drive this success? What are the key ingredients you're looking for? Uh, thank you, Andrew. So just uh, as a way of introduction, so I've been at Sky 12 years, as you know, um, <laughs> and the first uh, eight years I was leading uh, transformation teams, some internal transformation teams, which took on board all the big change programs that we had to do. And as, as we've alluded to already, Sky's a big organization and it got bigger as we went through the uh, acquisition of Germany and Italy it's got bigger again with Comcast and NBCU uh, Jesse to your point uh, connecting the dots sometimes I feel my role is head of dot connection <laughs> um, because there are a lot of dots to connect uh, as we think about Sky so and then in the last three years I've been looking after OTT and I'll come back to OTT in a minute but if I look back at some of the big change programs that I've led and run um, I was trying to think what are the key ingredients for success particularly when you look at it through uh, a lens of collaboration. And I came up with four. There probably are a load more, but the four things that I've seen work repeatedly in terms of how to drive collaboration across all those dots you talk about. Point one is have a really, really, really clear vision of what outcome you're trying to achieve. Whether that be a business outcome, whether you're doing it for a customer, but be able to articulate that vision really clearly. Because I think having context about what you're trying to achieve as a sort of like cornerstone for anything you want to do is really, really important. So spending a little bit of time up front articulating that, getting it down in paper, and being able to articulate it when anyone asks you, what are we doing here? Point two is around the leadership. And usually, a clear vision is really well articulated by great leadership. And so when I look at leadership for big change programs, I usually look at about three or four big roles uh, when I start it. Firstly, it's the sponsor. Who's the main person that's going to benefit from this big change and who's going to be the sort of like advocate for this vision and we really need to get a really strong sponsor or business lead you might call it uh, at, at one corner of it the next one is uh, the role that i used to play quite a lot which is one of sort of end-to-end -end program directors so someone who's going to join the dots and bring it all together and be worried about the end-to-end -end journey that we're on and whether that be a technology side all the way to the people change and everything in between. So we need someone who's, who's knowledgeable about how to do that and can join those dots together. Because of the nature of the work we do in Sky, there's always something around technology, so you need a really strong technology lead. So that underpins uh, most 99.9% .9 of the things we do at Sky when it's big change, is technology. And more importantly as well, the product or the service that we're providing either to the business or to the customer. So if I get those four sort of like people together, so I get the, the visionary, the sponsor, the person that can really articulate it, I get the program director, the one that's gluing it all together and knitting all the dots together, I get the product lead and the technology lead, and they work well as a group, I've got my foundations in place. So I'm ready to go then. I've got a clear vision, I've got good leadership, now what? And the next bit, um, I'm gonna use an analogy of uh, a cook for those of you who, who watch MasterChef. Um, I'm sure you have, and you, you see that scary moment where those contestants get put in front of a load of ingredients, and they say, come up with your best meal. And you think, how on earth am I gonna do that? And you can see it rattling around in their head, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and, um, and I always think sometimes when you've got leadership for a big change, it's a bit like facing all those ingredients and knowing then which are the ingredients you're gonna pick to achieve that outcome. And the great thing about Sky is we've already got a load of ingredients ready to go and we get more and more and more. But you don't always have all of them. And so those ingredients could be technology, they could be departments, they could be people, 
but quite often we need partners as well because we don't have a full suite. And that's when we need the startups, the partnerships, the external support, where we need that ingredient to bring it together and achieve that outcome. So next bit, understand your ingredients. So that's number three. So make sure you understand those people, departments, technologies, partnerships, startups, whatever it is, to achieve that outcome. And then the last thing and the most important thing for me is then once you know those ingredients, bring them together and establish one team. And that is really, really important so that everyone's pulling in the same direction. You've got your vision, you're clear on your leadership, you now know your ingredients, but what do you do to bring together one team? And we talk about things like kickoff meetings or away days or let's all go out and have a meal together and get to know each other. But by building those relationships across the ingredients early in the process, that builds trust. Once you've got trust and you know how to work together and you know how you're working well together, it doesn't really matter what challenges you face through the journey then because you've got a great team together to overcome them. So if I was to reflect on those ingredients for success and the things I've seen work at Sky again and again and again as we've done big transformation, it's those four things. It's just to summarize again, clear vision, really well articulated. What's the outcome, the business outcome, the customer outcome? Strong leadership that can articulate the vision and people can look up to and follow. Know your ingredients, who are the people, who are the teams, what's the technologies, what's the partnerships? and then build a one-team environment to bring it all together. And you get that in place, and you can move mountains, believe me. So look, that was just a, that was my summary of the no, key it's a, it's a great It's a great summary, and everyone can pick up uh, all the ingredients of some of them. There are actually two which I loved in your description. The first one is when you go to MasterChef and you go into the big uh, pantry. Uh, and one thing in 20 years, uh, 19, then with, with Sky, is that I always felt uh, we could do anything we wanted like you know when you are that participant the contestant at master chef and you get into this and you might have how do I, what do i choose to do that and, and which guys a bit like that i mean and even with the, the job i've been doing the last couple of years uh, really really you, you, you it, it, we can go after everything right not just because we have uh, a lot of those ingredients but going to second point uh, is because we are able to create trust uh, with the outside world. I'm finding this element of trust really important, um, not just because of the one you put together in a team that wants to deliver something, but also because it's the credibility we are able to take with us when we go and talk to partners. I'll give you an example I'm seeing myself now as we talk about glass. You know, you're seeing glass today and we are syndicating, I mentioned before, we're doing it with Foxtel. But there is basically almost any CEOs of MVPDs or telecoms to, at the moment where we connect and want to talk about the glass that open the door, uh, welcome Sky, and said, we share the same vision, we share the same opportunities and issues we try to solve. And there is an element of trust with this company, uh, which whoever of us you know, go out there and meet uh, with partners, on, uh, we, we, we take that with us, right? which is the credibility that built over the years uh, uh, which is particularly important and help us delivering. I mean, I'll come back to this later as we talk about with our OTT. And, and actually, I wanted to bridge from this more generic uh, uh, recipe, as, as you gave, uh, to, to something a bit more specific. Uh, we said we are in the building of now. You were part of the team uh, over the past 10 years. I think it's 10 years uh, this year that now was created, uh, we've done, walked a long way, and we're actually now expanding it quite a lot. I mean, as mentioned, Sky Showtime, we launched in 22 new markets in a matter of six months. Um, can you go back to that experience and tell us a bit more what, what you have learned through that? Yeah. Yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, uh, now, sorry, is 10 years old uh, this year, so we were celebrating the uh, birthday party a couple of months back. And so going back 10 years and thinking about, you know, streaming what is, was in its infancy really 10 years ago, the, the competitor set wasn't that broad, and we, we kicked off now uh, as a UK project, uh, specifically for the UK, to start uh, investigating the sort of streaming industry and what we could do, and, and launched a, a sort of like a, a complementary brand to Sky. Um, at the time, it was uh, specifically to the UK, uh, and then over the next few years, uh, as Germany 
and Italy uh, came on board as well, we needed some uh, ability to uh, expand internationally. So we think about the platform at the beginning was really focused particularly on the UK. And at that point, about 10 years ago, we partnered up and acquired a company called uh, Acetrax, which, uh, for those of you who know the OTT space, was a company that was uh, providing OTT services internationally in Europe 10, 11, 12 years ago. Um, and they were based in Portugal, and we acquired them, and they had some really great capabilities, some really great people, and a great team. Um, and they've stayed with us, and actually, uh, I'll come back to what they're doing today, but that Portugal team in Ace Tracks that we started with 10 years ago. So as we go through the years, we expanded the now proposition and the now uh, proposition to the customer was very successful, and we expanded that out to Ireland, to Italy, to Germany. So before you know it, the Sky footprint has got a now proposition in it, and it was underpinned by common platforms and common capabilities. So at that point, it was very much a mindset of where we started with the UK pivoting to an international platform where you're starting, rather than just building projects and developing projects, you're building platforms and capabilities. And it's very much a mindset pivot uh, to start thinking about that. So you're building once to deploy everywhere as opposed to looking at projects in, in individual territories or individual departments. So roll forward a few more years, and then uh, Comcast acquire Sky, and we're part of the family with Comcast and NBCU and uh, Sky, and then the opportunity came up to leverage our now OTT ingredients that we have in this underlying platform, which had already became an international platform to support Germany, Italy, uh, and the UK, and we could use that to pivot towards Peacock. And at the time when we started, obviously the Peacock brand wasn't uh, known at that point, and that launched in July 2020, and to great success, and it's continuing to power through in the US. So underneath those brands and underneath those slightly different propositions and uh, underneath that content, there's a lot of shared platform and capabilities that cut across that. So again, each time we go through a, a, a larger scale uh, move to another territory, another market, a different proposition, we're building more and more of those underlying platforms and capabilities that we know can reuse across a number of markets. And then fast forward to today, and as Andrea said, in I think it's nine, or how many days now? We've got 15 days to go, 14 days to go, and we launched Sky Showtime into a much broader set of European markets. Again, different brand, different content proposition, but under the covers, a lot of the same capabilities and platforms. So I think it's a really good example of, of, of working through a sort of like an individual project and then pivoting to sort of like a, a scalable technology platform that you can reuse again and again and again for different markets and slightly different propositions mm -hmm. with different brands. I talked about uh, Ace Tracks, which is the one we acquired back in the day 10 years ago. Uh, great to say that we now have a team, uh, a large team in Portugal, over three sites, uh, and the embryonic stages of that was Ace Tracks, <laughs> and they are a massive part of our OTT family in terms of delivering these services. And uh, some of the key people that were there at the beginning and the founders uh, at the beginning when we first acquired them are still there today mm. uh, developing as well. And this, this job has been fantastic for us because if you think uh, I think about Sky Showtime. Uh, uh, we signed the contract with Paramount for the joint venture and uh, the investment uh, agreement uh, the middle of August of last year. 13 months later, uh, we are ready to launch the first market and roll out. And uh, by the way, I've discovered how many, not just languages, but alphabets Europe has. <laughs> I think they kind of to what, I think 12 different alphabets. Um, and uh, I mean, Jesse, for you would be a nightmare, I think, if you get some of this. <laughs> if you got some of the Nordics uh, languages, is, is not. But I, again, I mean, ultimately, the technology allowed us to be quite fast in, into launching uh, into so many new markets. Uh, and back to my subject of this session, uh, actually, we had to dedicate much more time than we thought at people. Now, creating the right team and the right mix of people that could really launch uh, this effectively has been uh, as big as an effort uh, as building uh, the platform uh, itself. Now, we only have four more minutes. Uh, I have potentially some more questions for you guys, but I mean, I wanted to t take any question from the floor. Can I just ask a quick question? Of How course. Do you in, in, in general, you mean to, to when I look at opening for new business and new market, you mean? Or yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right, and it's 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 a very good question. First of all, you, you have to. I always start from the end. That that's my my solution, right? So I try to understand where I want to be. Where I need to be in 2030. 
in this specific, or the end could be anything, depending on where, what you're doing. And, and, go, and once I, I picture that end, uh, I go back and understand how to get, achieve that. And I always say that, you know, it's like your GPS. You know, once you fix your destination, uh, you might find a hurdle in between. Uh, and you have to take a detour and take a different road, but you don't change your destination, right? The, the GPS will drive you there. So, so the same, when I talk about priority, uh, what we look at is the typical exercise to look at uh, in, you know, what are the, uh, how many niches you need to get there, uh, where, what are the, the, the most feasible ones, uh, what are the, the most sizable ones. But ultimately, back to relationship, a lot of our job is today creating those relations to make this feasible. So the, the next uh, uh, streaming uh, expansion will happen through another partnership. Um, and, and, but to get to that one, we had explored five. Uh, ultimately, did we necessarily pick up what we thought was initially the right priority? Maybe not, but I mean, when you, and I think Jesse would be even better at saying this, it, there's a degree of pragmatism in your priority setting that you have to keep always with you. So the combination of setting your destination, being pragmatic over time and capture opportunity is fundamental. If I think about the way Sky Italia was created, uh, it was very opportunistic because at the time, actually uh, Sky Italia was created by, by News Corp uh, and News Corp was selling his pay TV in Italy. <laughs> and then Canal, who was the owner of the other telepew there, decided instead of buying to sell and they bought it and over time from sale became a buyer. Strategic, no, opportunistic, yes. 20 years later is the, the leading pay TV and actually media business in the country. So, so yeah, this define your destination and be opportunistic and pragmatic of what are your opportunities. Um, with AI and machine learning becoming so important for companies like uh, Sky, what are the, the main challenges that Sky is facing to build those capabilities? Um, and what are you doing about it? Is it mainly about building internally, partnering, acquiring companies? Anyone of you want to pick up this one? Uh, yeah, I, I can have a go for a start for 10. <coughs> so I think um, it's, a, it's a good question. So I think, I think it's a bit of everything. So it's, it's build, buy, and partner. So you know, I, think, um, I think that's really important because I think there's certain things that we can just build ourselves and we can build them really well. And that might be driven by the fact that we just have really deep subject matter expertise. Um, I think on the buy side, it's, it's kind of pretty, pretty vanilla. Um, you might just want to acquire that capability because it's just really important to you. Um, and then I think more so what's exciting um, is, is on the partner side. So, you know, a great example of that is stuff that you're working on, Jose, in, in terms of like sports clippings and automating that and providing that as a service. Uh, you know, that's really exciting. And it may be something that we definitely think about, um, but to your question, it isn't maybe a priority just yet, but it, but it should be. Um, and so working with third parties and partners like yourselves means that actually we can bump it up in the list uh, and kind of collaborate with people to, to deliver that sooner. There was another question. Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we definitely have some criteria in and around kind of the, I guess the practicalities of working with those companies. I think fundamentally, certainly within my team, and there's a bunch of teams across Sky, you know, Sky Labs being a great example that, that work with startups and, and other partners at different stages. But, but for us and specifically with it, within the teams that we operate in, like we are looking for teams that are slightly maturer, they have product in market, I mean, this is about trying to really integrate in with Sky and deliver a product and service that may be completely new. It may complement an existing product or service. Um, and so, you know, I think, yeah, in terms of like maturity and scale, certainly towards the latter end of that, they've gone through maybe really establishing their product market fit. They have a product in market, you know, the technology has been de-risked. And I think fundamentally, we're just looking for partners that, that really want to scale. So, you know, I think that's the key thing is that I think that's the sweet spot for us in terms of where we add value, um, in theory. Um, but you know, I think yeah, that they're the, probably the, the, the main ones that, that I certainly look for. Thank you. 
But before closing the session, I have a, a scary question for Jesse. Scary question. Scary is the, question. Scary is the yeah. answer, which do is it. actually, what do you prefer, a startup versus corporate culture? What and do I uh, prefer? Um, I, and, I, sorry, and why? And why? Okay. <laughs> uh, me, me personally, I, I definitely prefer a startup culture, but I think there's there's a lot of glitz and glamour and LinkedIn posts about why startup culture is fantastic and thrilling, and it is. Don't get me wrong. It's it's energetic. It's it's exciting. It's it's full of energy. It's opportunistic. It's it's all of that. But there's the counter side that people rarely talk about, which is like, it's also frightening. And it's also riddled with uncertainty. And you also run into challenges left, right, and center that Sky probably has dedicated teams solving for. You just don't even realize it happening in the background. Um, and I think there is that counter story that if you have to, it has to be something that you can just wholly and willingly embrace. And thankfully, I, I, I have that streak and that thread in me, so I don't care if I'm trying to fight with a payroll issue at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday night. Maybe my wife might say something <laughs> to me, but um, you know, that's part of the story that you just do have to wholly embrace, and I think a startup does offer both elements of that. Jesse, thank you so much. We could have not finished in a better way, I think. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot to everyone for this session. It's been a real pleasure to be with you.
really enjoy my role because it's changed so much, but I've been allowed to make my role grow. Um, and so that's what I really enjoy about working at Sky, is when I say, is that come to Sky, you've got lots of opportunities to grow um, and to change. You, you know, you can adapt your career to whatever it is you want to do. I needed a way into technology with a fine art degree background, which is not easy. And so um, I discovered the Technology Graduate Scheme. They accepted uh, graduates with any degree discipline. So I thought I've got a shot. I went for the interviews and got the role. And my tech journey started from there in earnest because I had the backing of Sky. While Sky is dynamic and fast-paced, it's also very collaborative and inclusive. Um, it's, it's fun working at Sky. Um, there's always new ideas, new opportunities uh, that you can try out. Uh, personally, from a career progression perspective, um, I've been able to try out many different roles and grow as an engineer, grow as a person, and I'm constantly learning all the time. Working at Sky, for sure you, you don't get bored. The payoff of the Sky brand that is a believing back that really summarizes what it's like uh, working in Sky. This continuous tension to improve things, to improve things for our customer, to improve things for our people. It's, it's incredible. It's still very much like the first day. It's, it's, uh, Sky is very dynamic. It keeps moving. The, the, there are no two years alike, really. It's very inspiring. It's exciting. It's fun. It's, it's very inclusive as well, which, which matters a lot to me. As a woman of color, um, that's one thing I'm really focusing on in terms of like, when I was coming up, there wasn't anybody that I could see um, that I could say, oh, great, I want to be like that person. And so it's me, I'm kind of like, okay, I want to be that for someone else. And I want to kind of create the space so that, you know, people can say, you know what, I can be that next leader, I can be that next person. I can be a woman in technology or I can be a person of color and, or I can be young, you know, there's all kind of spectrum of, um, of what that could look like. I joined Sky in 2020, a few weeks before the pandemic. My first impressions were, you know, it's obviously a massive company. Um, but also that the people were just really lovely. Sky is just such a great employer, honestly. I think um, really happy at Sky and I really get why people stay at Sky for a really long time and grow their career. Technology doesn't always mean coding. There are many other different roles in technology. So there's many different opportunities and avenues that women can actually try out. So it's just nothing to be scared of. And also showing that there are so many women already working here and we are really thriving and, and supporting each other in um, getting more talent into technology. Sky is amazing. It's a really um, welcoming, diverse, embracing company and it really supports you. If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. and. Um, I mean, gosh, how privileged are we? Our, our office is like Disneyland. <laughs> the people are amazing. They're clever, they care, they empower, and they genuinely want to see you do well and help you to do well. And I think the other part of working at Sky is it's, it, there's always innovation in the air and you can't help but be excited by it. Round of applause, anyone? <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, for those of you, well, I guess a lot of you won't know me actually. I'm Claudia Osain Sofwa, the Group Director for People, Talent, and DNI across Sky. Thank you for being here today. So, this spotlight session is all about Sky's approach in widening our talent pool within the tech industry. At Sky, we believe in better, but we know that better doesn't happen by itself, it's really driven by our people. And that's why we've got a fundamental belief that people are our most important assets. We're committed to widening the pool for three reasons. One, because we just want to make a positive impact more broadly, but also because we know it's important and better to, for Sky to have a workforce that reflects our workforce, um, sorry, our, our customer base. And thirdly, we know that a diverse workforce not only leads to agility, but also creates a culture of innovation, which ultimately need, leads to better business outcomes. But it's not just about visible diversity, it's also about diversity of thought. So if you think about the benefits of the melting pot of cultures, backgrounds, perspective, experiences, coming together to share ideas. Now we know that innovation is at the heart of what we do at Sky, we don't make any bones about that. But to, for innovation to thrive, it needs to be an environment where people can challenge the status quo, really be able to go against the grain and ultimately feel empowered and included. So I'm gonna share with you a VT from my colleague, Sharon Wallace who is the head of DNI within the technology team. And she's going to talk you through why inclusivity is important to us at Sky.
Inclusion is about everybody getting a chance to be heard, everybody getting the same opportunities. We're being equitable in our approach and we'll build an environment where everybody can thrive and flourish. Across the tech teams at Sky, we have a lot of activity going on at the moment with regards to how we build this inclusive environment. We have the Lift As We Climb initiative with IBM and Vodafone when we're supporting senior women in leadership in technology. We have the inclusive learning modules that we are trying to roll out across um, the broader sky. We have a lot of initiatives uh, with regards to mentoring, support, and how we build that better environment where everybody feels they belong and where everybody feels they can really thrive. At Sky, we want to build and design products and services that are available for everyone. So therefore, we want a variety of experiences and background and in our decision making, in our creation, in our ideation. My favorite story in the DNI world is one about Bletchley Park uh, up in Milton Keynes. Back in World War II, that's where the code breakers were based. They had a team of the top mathematicians from the top universities and they couldn't seem to break the Enigma code. But what they did was they put a crossword puzzle in a newspaper and they said, if you solve this, you've won a prize, contact us. What they did there was they ended up recruiting a team of code breakers who did go on to break Enigma and they were men and women from a variety of backgrounds. There was professors of philosophy there, there was a Jewish woman, there was a German man, there were so many people from so many different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, from uh, different experiences, academic and otherwise. And together, they came together into this wonderful, inclusive environment and solved Enigma. That is what inclusion can do, by bringing the people in and giving them an environment where they can really flourish. So we know the tech industry has a long way to go, but there are grounds of optimism. So if I introduce our first speaker, six years ago, he had no idea how he was going to get into technology and even specifically the media industry. And now I'm pleased to say he's one of our rising stars and I will look at my notes to read this. This year, he won the Royal Television Society prestigious Young Technologist of the Year Award. Please welcome Jarrell Wright, our user support specialist at Sky. Hi, Jarrell, how are how you? Are. I'm good, thank you, how are you? Good, nice to see you. We just discovered we're both from South London, so yeah, we've got a little common interest there. Good, in, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations on your achievement. Thank you. Can you tell us about your journey so far in tech? Um, from when it started? Or? Mm, yeah, right from the beginning. Um, so I was at the job centre. Um, I didn't really have no direction in where my life was going. So um, I had a really good work called, called Esther, and I told her I wanted to do something in media. And she presented me three leaflets, and one of them was the Mama Youth Project um, scheme. So I read through it, I thought it was interesting, and I applied for it. And then from that application has pretty much brought me to where I am today. So. And, what has, and I'll say, for, my, for you, those of you that don't, don't know, Mama Youth is a, an organisation that trains young people from underrepresented groups and helps them carve out a career within the media industry. So that's, they've been a part of the Sky for a while now. Thanks for sharing. So what has been your biggest learning so far? Um, just how many different job roles there are in television, media, technology, and um, how many different processes there are to achieve an outcome. So one company might create a television show a certain way compared to another company, but you still achieve the same outcome by doing loads of different things. So mm. I think that, yeah. And what has been the big biggest surprise in terms of technology? Um, just how I've grown up from putting like a video into the video player or a CD into the CD player to just everything streaming now. Mm. You can just pick up your mobile phone, watch a movie, listen to music. So I think that jump in technology has been really big, yeah. And if you were to give advice to someone in your position, say, you know, starting out in their career, what advice would you give them? Keep learning. I think in technology, everything's always changing. So if you're learning, you're always going to be on top of the curve. So I would say, yeah, just keep on top of learning. And yeah, it should be all right. <laughs> so how, 
how would you describe the uh, culture at Sky? I mean, we obviously heard from some of our uh, technology employees today, but I'd love to hear it in your words. What, what do you mean by a coach? Like just what it's like to work at Sky. Um, I didn't go to university, so I kind of liken it, and I, I haven't even really seen a university, but I just think it's like a university campus kind of thing in terms of you're going from building to building to do certain different things. Um, in terms of culture, I think it's diverse in that I've met people that I don't think I would have met just being on the road or through my friends and things, so mm. yeah, I think, yeah. And uh, what would you say to the lady that recommended Mama Youth to you? I understand you're still in contact, so. Yeah, definitely, you are, six years later. always praises and thanks to her. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's changed my life. It hasn't kind of, yeah, it's changed my life, really, so yeah. Mm. And last one for me before we move on to Conrad. Uh, so what's the future for you? Where would you, I guess, where would you see yourself in the next five years? It's uh, not an interview, by the way, but just keen to understand. It, it feels that way. <laughs> I know, it's um, such a standard question. So you can clearly see I'm in HR. Um, um, yeah, it's right. I don't really know how to answer those kind of questions. Um, like I said, as long as I'm learning, learning, I should be on top of whatever it is to come, so. And hopefully still at Sky. No pressure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jarrell. Thank right. you. So I'd like to introduce Conrad. He is our Head of Emerging Talent and Head of Software Engineering Academy at Sky. So welcome to the stage. So we've obviously Thanks. heard about <laughs> Jarrell's journey into Sky, but we know that there's many different schemes that we have. Some are award winning, so I'd love you to be able to share with the audience today a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I run the Software Engineering Academy at Sky. Uh, and pretty much my job is to encourage people uh, to start a career in technology um, and hopefully come and join one of our schemes and then to develop them throughout their early years at, uh, at Sky and in, uh, in technology. So the academy itself is uh, divided into three key pillars. Um, we have pre-entry level, um, which is where we are pretty much out there talking about Sky and uh, all of the great things that we, uh, that we do here. But one of the key things that we do in, uh, in this particular pillar is something called Get Into Tech. Um, and originally that was aimed at uh, encouraging women from any background uh, to consider a career in technology. Um, and uh, we started that in, uh, in 2016. Um, and uh, we've been running it every year uh, since. And over the years, we've brought th over 300 women through that course, and a third of them are here at Sky today um, as practicing software engineers. And we've expanded the Get Into Tech scheme um, by uh, offering it uh, through a series of reskilling opportunities to people across uh, Sky that aren't necessarily in technology, but would like to know more, uh, and giving them the means then to come and start a career with us if they, uh, if they want to. And what the scheme promises to do is develop them to a point where they are then able to apply for entry level roles in technology. So that moves on then to the second pillar, which is all about entry level. Um, and uh, that's where all of my graduate schemes sit and all my apprenticeships and summer placements uh, and what have you. And we have a number of different routes that, that we use, but broadly speaking, it's divided into a technical track um, uh, which is where we get our software developers from and DevOps engineers and reliability engineers and automated testers. And then we have a more business related track, which uh, normally we get our project managers, scrum masters, uh, analysts from and what have you. So if you're coming to, uh, to, to technology, um, we can offer you a wide range of different opportunities across the whole of our, uh, whole of our estate. And then finally, post entry level, this is what happens when people are already in the business with us. How do we develop them? How do we, uh, how do we progress them into, uh, into bigger roles across, uh, across technology? Because if you imagine that we're bringing all this great entry level talent into the organization, but we don't want them to reach a point where they can't go any further. So we have to give careful thought in terms of how we progress people into bigger roles across the, uh, across the technology organization. Um, so we have a number of uh, training routes that enable us to do that, a number of, uh, a number of live experiences. Again, we have um, uh, additional schemes that people can enroll on where if they need to develop further skills to further their career or even move to a different area of the business, 
where they are then able then to, uh, to practice a different technology stack, perhaps. We can enable them to, uh, to do that. Um, and if we've got people that have come through the, these routes um, and they don't have uh, you know, computer science degrees or, or what have you, um, because uh, like Hannah was saying on the, on the VT there, um, she was from a fine art background. Um, we have many people that come from different backgrounds um, uh, and we've never not been able to turn them into successful engineers. But if you want those qualifications, you can study with us um, and you can study up to a master's degree whilst you're in the business um, working in your delivery team. So what I'm able to do is I can take someone that's never written a line of code before. I can bring them through getting to tech. I can bring them through an entry level scheme. I can get them into delivery teams. I can get them progressing into medium roles, senior roles. I can get them to a point where they've got their computer science degree and master's degree. And I can do that in around about three years. Great, thank you. Hope that was okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and just bearing in mind that you're working with people that don't have a view on tech because they're early on in their career, what are some of the misconceptions that you hear about the technology world? So, so I, I, think, I think when I talk to people, particularly people that have never been um, you know, involved in technology, it's kind of seen as this, this, as this mystic art. Mm. Um, so, so we have to do a lot of work in terms of breaking down those, uh, those barriers. Um, and uh, essentially this is one of the things that I think does need more work mm. in terms of how do, we, how do we bring those curtains down a little bit, how do we um, demystify what technology is about um, and uh, you know, looking at people that from you know, different, area, different walks of life, perhaps you're in HR, perhaps you're in marketing, um, you have skills that will help you with a technology career. We've just got to show you how you can apply them. You talked to quite a lot, a lot of schemes there, so it might be hard to choose, but which one are you most proud of? Um, I've got to say I am proud of the Getting to Tech um, uh, scheme. Um, it was something at, at the time which um, hadn't really been tried before. Um, it was one of those situations when we kind of all sat around the meeting table trying to, trying to work out what the scheme could look like. And first question was, you know, where are we going to fish? Where are we, where, where, where we going to look? Because we can't look in the current technology pools because we already know that there's a, a chronic shortage of women in, in, in those spaces. So it was kind of like saying we want to go and fish in sectors that, that we've never, ever been in before. Uh, and um, I think we were, you know, you know successful even our, in our first year of bringing people in from you know, non-technology backgrounds who, you know, just had the drive and the passion to, uh, to you know, to want to learn to write software. Um, and, uh, and, and then the following year, we had people rolling off those schemes into, into sky rolls and, uh, and in delivery teams. Great, thank you. So we'll welcome Nishi Lal, who's our head of young people at Sky. Can you tell us about the amazing work with Sky Up and Academy Studios? Yeah, so thank you, um, Claudia. Um, so I have probably the most incredible job at Sky. Um, over the past 10 years, I've had the opportunity to inspire the next generation to build their skills and as part of Sky Up is to give them access, opportunities so that they can have a better future. And that involves our immersive experience here at Sky um, on site. So that's uh, for 18 to 16 year olds to create their very own pieces of content. They create the stories, they write scripts and actually get hands on with technology. And they're able to then create their own news reports or their short story trailers. Since launching, and I must say today is a very important day, as well as the Tech Summit, we are actually officially 10 years old today. Oh. We have broad me. <laughs> We had our first primary school walk through the doors. Um, 165,000 kids have physically been through our doors for the experience, which is actually phenomenal. Um, we've heard your real story about when you went to the job center. What our experience allows young people to do is get behind the scenes of TV, learn about the different roles that are available in the creative industries by doing the roles themselves as part of the experience. They are the editors, they are the camera operators, they are the producers, directors, and the presenters. They get to leave with their very own short story or their news report. Teachers have found the experience as a way to bring to life sometimes some often difficult subjects in the classroom, so whether that's from cyberbullying or that's from sort of self-image, um, and also kind of educating them around sort of important topics like the climate. Um, 
students are able to kind of work as teams, so building those all important teamwork skills, communication, collaboration, developing all of those um, in the short space of time that they have with us. And yes, it does happen. And from my evaluation reports, you know, 97% of teachers are saying it's had a positive impact on them. It's built their confidence and actually given them the opportunity to think about what they might do next. Um, we know that from the stories um, that teachers have told us, the students, so we still hear through the corridor as they leave, this was the best school trip ever. <laughs> um, and if I could bottle that, the amount of times I've heard that, um, it would be just wonderful. Um, but we know that we inspire them to take the next steps in their academic journey, but also their careers. Mm. So we had a young girl called Darren, um, who I kind of serendipity met during lockdown. Um, and she was doing fashion PR. She changed direction and came to me for some advice. And at the time when I was speaking with her, she didn't realize that I ran Academy Studios. I hadn't realized as a year eight student, she had come to the experience. She said that it was coming to Sky and seeing the environment and seeing how t TV was being made and having the experience that helped her take the next steps she went on to become the first female black presenter for Formula E, which is absolutely phenomenal. There's also a young man called Brandon who came as a year nine student with his school and is now working at Sky as a virtual production software engineer, uh, which is again, testament to the experience and how we've been able to impact those young people to make fundamental decisions about what they might want to do, whether that's in the world of tech, the creative industries, or take that next big step for them. And we've heard Jill's story and all the great work that, you know, Conrad is doing in terms of t the technology. And, you know, we want to do more. Um, and we realize that Academy Studios, as brilliant as it also had barriers to participation. You know, being able to reach those students that we can't because of travel distance or they can't afford to. So we decided to take the Academy Studios on tour. So this year in June, we launched on tour we started in Ipswich, um, where we were able to engage 4,000 young students, um, give them agency to talk again about the things that they care, they care about um, around climate change. Um, it's been received incredibly well. Um, we are off to Bradford next week, and we will be traveling around the country. Um, it's been hugely successful, and I think what will help to bring it to life if we show you a short VT. <laughs> Sky Up Academy Studios on tour finally hits the road. Our first host school is Ipswich Academy, able to bring this immersive experience to the students here, develop their digital skills and share stories about the things that they care about. Sky Up represents our mission to unlock possibilities in a digital world so that individuals from all backgrounds have the resources, skills and opportunities to create a better future using a pop-up photography studio or a high-tech digital media suite inside an ear vehicle to give young people from all backgrounds access to a creative studio. Just seeing the students um, in their work engaged, working with the Sky Ambassadors, they'll go home today, they'll tell their parents, their carers, their brothers and sisters about what they've done today. The impact that that's going to have on our students is very hard to put into words. And I think when you've been able to spark the imagination of a young person, no matter what they do next, is something that will stay with them forever. The biggest impact will be when these students go home tonight with their lanyards, the job role that they, they held, and then also the products that they've got, the cards, to look at the different possibilities within Sky and really open up those doors. The future of young people is in our hands today, and our future will be in their hands tomorrow. Sky Up Academy Studios on tour. So it'd be good for the audience to hear, is this work for young people unique just to the media industry? Um, there's some great work that's being done with young people out there and there's some great experiences that many organisations that are running and, and have done for a number of years. But I'm yet to come across an organisation that is bringing young people into the heart of their headquarters to deliver them experience Monday to Friday, 60 kids a day, all through the year, throughout the summer, and giving them the opportunity. Um, so there is no experience like that. And there are two Ducato vans 
out in this country, and I had two of them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there isn't this experience going out to schools. Um, it's been a unique experience in every way. Mm. And I think, you know, to, to be able to do this, to also then create an employable generation, um, we had a young person in Ipswich say, you know, to us to say, I can go home and tell my mum today that editing is a real job. Um, it's not just something I do on YouTube. Editors do exist. <laughs> and that's what's unique to this experience. That's what we bring, and that's what we're able to do um, to create um, the future employees of the industry. Great, fantastic, thank you. And last but not least, we've got Carrie Wooten, who's <coughs> the Managing Director of RISE. <laughs> Get on the chair. <laughs> Hi. 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 The first question is, can you tell everyone about RISE? Yes, yeah, so RISE is an organisation that's looking to achieve gender diversity within the media technology industry. But importantly, what we've got is our Rise Up Academy, which is trying to achieve diversity more broadly within the media technology industry and also to look at the skills crisis that we're currently facing across the sector. And what we're really trying to do is to inspire and educate and inform young people very much like Nishi's been talking about with the Sky Up Academy programme about the opportunities and pathways that there are available in the industry. We know... We know particularly in technology roles and particularly kind of in those traditional engineering roles that we've got an older white male workforce mm. and we know that universities, particularly in these engineering subjects, are struggling to recruit those students. So we're really trying to get in from, you know, students from eight to nine years old right through to 18-year-olds to try and inspire them about those pathways. And, and as kind of everybody's reflected on the panel so far, we're, it's really clear that we're, as an industry, we're not getting the message out there enough about the breadth of opportunities that there are within our sector and that you know, as your VTs have really explicitly said, we need that culture, we need that diversity of thought and still to be done. And that's, um, you know, that's really reflected through the companies that we speak to and the, the discussions that are happening. And I think particularly around the skills crisis that is mm. happening, you know, it's the only subject I hear at the moment is how people are struggling to recruit diverse talent and also t talent broadly. Just there isn't that, there isn't that breadth of people coming through. So that's what the Rise Up Academy is really trying to do. And this summer we had our first ever summer school mm -hmm. where we had 500 young people come through. Uh, so we had so it was two days each. So it was 11 to, oh, I'm trying to remember now, 11 to 14 year olds for two days and then 15 to 18 year olds for the second two days. And they got to experience eight different workshops. So they got to build a four camera studio and gallery from scratch. They had virtual production, graphics, cloud technology, post-production. And I was just saying before this session actually that um, on the feedback forms, one of the <laughs> students wrote on one of the sessions, this is the most boring thing ever, I really didn't like it. And then another student went, oh my God, this is incredible. And I was like, brilliant. Yeah. Because that's exactly what we need to do, is to try and allow young people to understand. As you said, like, there's so many opportunities within organisations like Sky and other companies across the sector. But as a young person to understand, actually, post-production is not for me, but actually virtual production might be, or, or that actually an OB opportunity might be for me, and I want to be a sound engineer. But we... We've struggled to date, I think, to get that message through to young people. And um, hopefully we did that with the, with the summer school. And um, the feedback we had was incredible. We had over 100 volunteers from across the industry, over 40 companies involved. And, um, and I've got a short VT to demonstrate as well. So it'd be great if we could show you that. Thank you. OK, sound on W. The Rise Up Academy Summer School is running for a week at Global Academy in Hayes and we're reaching out to 500 young people. We've got 11 to 14 year olds for two days and then 15 to 18 year olds for another two days. We are trying to inspire and educate and inform them about all the different opportunities there are in the media technology industry. Sound supervisor running the sound. Camera operators. Graphics operators. Voiceover. Are these operators? Some young people here who are trying out post-production, VFX, uh, graphics, an Adobe truck outside, build a full camera studio and a whole lot more, um, hoping that we can inspire, educate and inform them in the opportunities that could exist for them. We've got all of these amazing, incredible opportunities for these young people to really understand where their interests might lie. It might be that they're interested in being involved in OBs or it might be that they're, they're thinking about virtual production, but we're giving them the chance to understand what these technologies involve from a practical point of view and where their careers might go.
So in the next five years, if you think about the context of this work, where would you like to see the industry? Oh, goodness. Next five years, mm. I'd like to see that breadth of talent coming through. I think there's, there's something around that post-18 pathway. So I'd like to see that post-18 pathway be a little more really clear for young people. Universities are an amazing route for coming into the industry, but they're not for everybody. And actually, mm. if we want diverse talent coming through, I think we need to look at what that that post-18 pathway looks like, and T-levels are something that we're working quite closely on. So I'd like that to be established, the T-level programme, having that really clear pathway going, if you want to be in this industry, then this is your role, this is your step, this is your step, this is your step, this is your step, and being, that being really clear and working, and from a Rise Up perspective, being really clear and working collaboratively and collectively with the, the whole of the industry to make sure that we're achieving the diversity that we want to see in the, in the industry. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll move into Q&A now, so if anybody's got any questions, I think they've got the Slido um, directions on, on the screen there. We've spoken a lot today about growing our own talent, essentially, uh, which is there's been some incredible work that's taken place, obviously, within RISE and also at Sky. What do you think else we could be doing to widen the talent pool to, pool to gain that attraction more externally? And I'll go to you, Conrad, for that one. So, so it, by being brave. I think is the is the word like I say when we were when we were designing uh, getting to tech and thinking about how that was going to work, you know I can remember having the conversations in terms of what do you mean you're going to go into the financial sector and, and look for software engineers <laughs> and that have never done software development? What do you mean you're going to go to HR and what have you? But that is the way forward um, to you know to look at the pools that that, that you wouldn't expect to get uh, to get technology talent from. But just bear in mind that if you if you go that way, it is a lot of work, um, you know, to, to you know to bring people in, into the business and develop them. They won't be able to go into teams immediately, yeah. but they will absolutely give you a hundred percent, and they, if they're absolutely driven, and actually then they will make your workforce of tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. That investment piece is critical, mm. right? It's all very well going out, but if, we, if within a, within an organisation, if you don't have that investment in terms of training and support and bringing them into the culture of your organisation, then actually it fails. So I think, yeah, yeah really critical. Yeah. I definitely think education is, is key. And then I always say the customer for me is the teacher and the beneficiaries are the students. Mm. So if if we are taking young people through a journey of kind of their, their education world and then through to their careers, how informed are those people that are carrying them through their journey, through whether that's in the classroom or whether that's engaging the parents? So how do we educate them to create that pathway and put those stepping stones down for them? And I think that education piece is, 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 is critical to it. Yeah, thanks. So we've got a question for you. Let's come from Slido. She says, and then she can't see it again. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, so, Jarrell, what's something that could have helped you or supported you even more coming up in your career? Oh, um... <laughs> is the question that goes through? That's okay. What's something that could have helped or supported you even more coming up in your career? Um, I feel like the support I've had has been very, very good, and um, I, I don't know what I could add to it. Um, Sure, I've gone blank. That's yeah. all right. That's okay. Yeah, sure. You can always come back to it if something comes to mind. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I'll ask. This is all for, for for all four of you. I'll start with you, Carrie. Yeah. What's the one thing you would like the audience to take away from the session today? Oh, that's a great question. The the change we want to see is possible, but it does need us to all work collectively to achieve those outcomes. Like we know that like, the proof is in the pudding. We've had so many amazing examples of how change can happen, but we all do need to, it's our, all of our individual responsibilities to make that change happen, but we've got to work together to achieve it. So yeah, I'd love you to all take that away. Get involved in, in the Academy Studios workshop. Come and talk to me about RISE. Come and talk to Conrad about how you can support his program, how Jarrell, you know, his experiences can be replicated. I think there's so much that we individually can do as well as collectively. Great, thanks. Con Conrad? As I was saying before, be brave. Be brave, yeah. Yeah, um, be innovative in, in 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 your recruitment. There are people out there that are beating down the door to come and be in a technology career, but they just go. They don't believe at the moment they can achieve it. Mm. So how do we uh, how do we you know impress upon them that they can? How do we uncover the skills that they've already got that they can then bring to the table and have a successful career in technology? Um, I'd say take people on the journey 
um, don't underestimate the impact that you can have from the smallest conversations to those bigger presentations that you have with people. I think being able to just ignite something in a young person's mind, whether that's just somebody that's just joined your company or your business or your team or your department, don't under underestimate how that might actually impact their career longer term. So even when I work for my team, who are actually here today in the audience <laughs> as well, um, when you speak to young people, there is that small nugget that you might leave with them and you may change the rest of their life. So don't underestimate your own powers. Yeah, thank you, Will. What's the one thing you'd want the audience to take away from the session, um, your experience and your words? I think for me, I had to see it to believe it. So until I came to Sky and saw the campus and spoke to the people and saw the server rooms and all the different bits of technology, I didn't know it existed. So yeah, I think that's a big thing for people to see what's actually going on, to really believe that they can do it or get into it. Great. Thank you. Thanks to the panel today. That was really insightful. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm hoping that you're all feeling inspired and encouraged to consider an opportunity at Sky or even just to find out more. So if that is the case, then please visit the Tech Summit website that will give you more information about Sky more broadly, but also what careers we have available. So thank you for your time and great to see you all.
to the hub and those of you who are streaming at home, a warm welcome to you as well. The topic and theme of this year's Tech Summit has been innovation, and now we're really going to get to the heart of it. We're going to be speaking about how do you make innovation happen? How do you create the environment and culture that is needed for that? I'm Mia Ruotsala, I'm Group Director of Digital Transformation and Sky Labs. In digital transformation and creating digital experiences for customers, obviously innovation is really at the heart of everything we do because we have to win the customer back every day and create seamless and amazing experiences that are enabled by technology. As Sky Labs, we play even a bigger role in innovation. We really get to the heart of innovation. Um, Sky Labs was created as an innovation function for Sky around three years ago. We had been previously working with different innovation agencies um, as well as different management consulting companies. And as many different big corporates realized that we spent a lot of time explaining to those companies what Sky was about, what our strategy was, and then explaining the kind of question that we had on our mind and asking them to answer it. And the reason why Sky Labs was created is that we really felt passionately that having this kind of innovation function that combines strategy, insight, um, as well as technology into one you know, core unit and team um, inside Sky was something that would enable us to go faster, uh, really make sure that our strategies were de-risk, prototype things quickly, rapidly fail, uh, because Sky Labs really is the place where we're able to connect all of the different things and themes that happen across our company and therefore help and facilitate with the innovation. There's five main things that we do at Sky Labs um, in order to make this happen. And like I said, um, Sky Labs is really the heart of facilitation of innovation. We believe that the questions the company needs to answer already lie within our company, the data, the information that we get from our customers, as well as the people, the amazing talent and brains we have at Sky. So it's a lot about how do we enable those bright minds and those ideas to actually come to life. And the five different things we do to make this happen, we combine insight, strategy, and implementation. We might be rapidly prototyping ideas and seeing if they fail. Uh, we will be looking at different research, how our customer and consumer habits changing at the moment, for instance, right now because of the cost of living crisis, and how do we bring those macro topics then back into our business, and how does that morph Sky strategy? We also spend a lot of time facilitating innovation, like I said. Most of the time we'll use different tools and techniques, run workshops, for instance, as much as it is about the method of bringing these people together and running these kind of sessions, it's also about casting the right group of people together. Sometimes there might be a challenge in the commercial function, but we bring then people from data, technology, customer service, perhaps the guy who's driving the van, going to your home and installing uh, your devices in your home, and we bring that kind of cast of characters together to blend those different insights and knowledge, and therefore, again, get to the right outcomes as a company. Technology, obviously, is at the heart of very much of innovation and disruption for a company like Sky. So again, we work together also with our partners, NBC and Comcast. We look at emerging technology. We then see how this could be implemented across Sky. Uh, we test it quickly. That often goes normally quicker than, for instance, our BAU teams. We have that space to, to quickly try and fail it and then hand it over to the different teams inside the business and technology and product teams. And obviously a key part is that we can't just do it alone at Sky Labs. A big part is then uh, facilitating the training, making sure that we're bringing practices like design thinking or agile methodology into the ways of working for the different departments and individuals. So we notice many people who come through our different boot camps and come through our different facilitation sessions, we make sure that they're able to take those learnings and those methodologies and then bring them again into their day-to-day -day work working with their teams. So again, making sure that we're federating that innovation and enabling that to happen across the board. And then fifth, last but not least, uh, the culture of innovation. And how do we really cherish that and make that grow in a company like Sky, a big corporate with tens of thousands of employees? Um, we run hackathons. We do things like Labs Day, which happens twice a year, where we source hundreds of ideas from all across the company, bring them to our execs for pitch days, and then actually make sure that those ideas get implemented and onto the roadmap. We've also created something called Brain Trust, which brings together more than a thousand individuals across our company, and our execs are able to pose questions to them that are on their mind, 
and then get those answers from those thousands of people. We call this brain trust, like I said. So look, let's get to the main event. I have a fantastic group of women and technologists who are going to join me here. And I will welcome them at the same time as I step back. <laughs> We have uh, Christina Gomila, <laughs> who's Managing Director of Content Technology and Innovation, overseeing the media supply chain, broadcast, engineering, and operations. Christina, you joined Sky in 2019, and it's the same year when you were awarded the Progress Medal from the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineering, and therefore you became the first woman to ever be awarded this. Just a fantastic achievement. Um, to add to the list, <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to smile when you've got a fantastic group of people here up on stage with me. To add to the list, uh, Christina, you obviously have an extensive background in R&D, and you are the author of more than 70 awarded patents. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, next, we've got Ruth Dawson. Ruth is the Senior Vice President of Emerging Technologies and General Manager of Comcast Silicon Valley, also close partner of Skylabs. So fantastic having you on this side of the Atlantic, Ruth. Uh, Ruth and her team focus on identifying, developing, and handing off beneficial new technologies that accelerate or automate the business. Ruth joined Comcast in 2005, and you know, first when she joined, she was the VP of Engineering. Her technology career spans, are you ready for it? Product management, software development, cloud computing, embedded software, IP delivered video, immersive technologies, machine learning, data science, and computer vision. It's a pleasure to have you here at Skyroof. Thank you. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Dr. Sophia Goldberg. And Sophia has recently been promoted from senior to lead data scientist in innovation and artificial intelligence at Sky. Congratulations, yeah. Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia joined Sky in uh, 2020 and works cross-functionally on personalization and recommendation engines with the goal of delivering better content to Sky's customers across TV, mobile, and all our future products. Sophia is also a visiting research fellow at King's College London. Previous to Sky, you were working as a data scientist and machine learning researcher at Streetbees, the human intelligence platform that's seeking to disrupt market research. And in case you're wondering what Sophia's PhD is in, it's in theoretical cosmology. Um, I had to actually Google that as well. <laughs> in essence, it's really to understand how our planet and the universe was created. Hopefully, I managed to say that yeah, in the right way. So yeah. <laughs> Good. So three remarkable uh, technologists that join me here. Um, and it's going to be fantastic to get to know you and understand how you apply innovation in your areas. Christina, we're going to start with you. Um, you're a hugely accomplished innovator, recognized both externally as well as inside Sky. How do you manage the teams and lead the teams and create that kind of environment that nurtures innovation and, and that sort of daringness of, of innovating? I very, very much believe that every team can be innovative. It's really not because of the people or your background. I think there are two beacons. One would be to have a leadership that inspires and to have the right environment. But an innovator leader should not be managing a team, let's make no mistake here, should empower the team. Because really the knowledge and the ideas should come from the teams. So uh, an innovator leader is uh, someone that will prove respect and listen and challenge, and sometimes uh, drive and show the teams the limit, or actually the lack of limit, on what they can try to do. But the environment is also very important, because the environment requires to be brought in off, at the same time to challenge, at the same time to protect those that have the, the boldness to, to innovate. I think there the sky really is, is an example. Uh, I was through many sessions today when they presented the sky glass and some of the fantastic products that we have 
uh, uh, innovated over many years. In all of them, there were a few things in common. There was an incredible ambition. There was a lot of passion. And there was a good understanding of what customers may need and want. So let's not forget that in innovation, it's very important to be focused. You could research about many, many things, but you want to make it meaningful. And when you put all these things together, you really can get any team, really, to become innovative and to probably go far, far and beyond to what they ever thought they were able to deliver. So a lot of your job is then actually leading instead of innovating yourself and setting those boundaries and risk. And I think, especially when you mention about the boundaries, allowing those teams probably to be enabled themselves, right? And understanding where, the, where that line is drawn. You, you never innovate alone. Innovation, innovation is not something that happens in, <laughs> with, a, with a crystal ball and you can get the, the inspiration. It comes from, from listening to many, from the diversity, from many, many things that can bring ideas, challenge them. And, and that it's something that's important as well, which is the risk. In innovation, I, I, I will not start talking about how many things didn't work. <laughs> uh, but keep that in the X file. <laughs> yes, we can keep that for another moment. But, but it's, it's important also when, when you are with a team to, to share with them your own failures because it's, it's important for them to learn to take risk along with you and with the company. We're going to come back to some of those themes. Um, Ruth, maybe next over to you. Um, your role at Comcast includes running Comcast Labs in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. How do you and your team encourage innovation to flourish? And how do you really measure also the success that's sometimes tricky in innovation? I'll come back to the measurement in a second. <laughs> but yeah, I, I would just further on what Christina said in that you've got to have the right environment. Uh, you want to encourage ideas. In fact, you want many more dea ideas than you can do something with, right? And then you apply the focus. And I think Dana touched on this this morning. You really want to ensure you've got an inclusive environment so everyone feels safe in putting any idea on the table. Uh, and then you've got to actually have the focus to filter through it. Uh, and then I would also just add, I, I actually say to my team, if, if there aren't some failures, we're not taking enough risk. We're not pushing ourselves hard enough to really, really see what we can do. And, and we do look at a lens with like three to five years in the future. And so, you know, you're, you, you're definitely going to have some failures and that's okay. Um, and then coming back to your question about measurement, it is a tricky area to measure, but it's things like patents. Um, my team, you know, writes and researches so a number of papers, so those tangible things that you can measure. We do proof of concepts. How many can we hand off to the business for deployment? Um, so those are the things that we can measure um, along with, you know, just the, uh, the other intangibles. Yeah. And I think that, you know, fear of failure, that's such a big impediment to many companies, and that stops the teams and individuals from yeah. being able to innovate. How do you personally coach your team through that after yeah, a failure? I, I think it's looking at it with a different lens, not looking at it as a failure, but looking at it as something you may not move forward with. Maybe it's too soon to move forward with, but that you will still have learnings from it. So taking away the positive is we learned something out of this, and that's okay. Um, and that's, that's really how I think you compartmentalize it and accept it and, and almost rebrand it from failure to just something that maybe didn't get deployed. And probably your job is as much to coach, coach the team exactly. it, but also coach perhaps the management and the board Absolutely, for it. They need to be comfortable. Absolutely. Well, and also show the value add out of something that was learning. Because we have had many things that three years ago it didn't go anywhere, and now it'll go somewhere. And that's okay, too. Just the patience. <laughs> yes. Good. So, Sophia, as I mentioned, you joined Sky two years ago from a startup. So tell us a little bit about the difference of a startup and then a big corporate like Sky. And also, I guess the key question is there, how do you in a huge corporation like Sky, together with NBC and Comcast and the wider group, how do we bring some of that startup mentality? And, and can we bring that? Uh, talk through that. Yeah, so um, I think one of the key differences, at least for me personally, as on, on the data science side, building a staff day-to-day -day has to be, you know, when you're in a startup, 
when you develop something, it will be like 50% of the product. <laughs> you know, when you build something, it's a new thing. You know, you're a startup, so a priori, you haven't got the products yet. You know, you're building them from scratch. So I think there can be this kind of like, that, that was what was exciting about being in a startup. But I think I got to a point where, okay, I was working on one product, but I wanted to learn how do we deploy to many products, multiple products in a massive organization. Um, and when you're at a company like Sky, obviously you have access to the latest and greatest. So, you know, we work on cloud technologies and it feels like from a development point of view, you have an infinite resource essentially. And, you know, it's not the same in a startup. So I think I was at a point at least where I wanted, okay, I, I'd had that, that experience, but I wanted to learn what it's like building these bigger products, deploying to millions of customers. You've also got a different set of problems, you know, in a startup, as I said, you, so maybe you have a user base established, but maybe you don't, that's a big problem. Um, whereas in a large organization, you have this big user base. It's almost like you want to leverage that. You want to grow at the same time. You want to keep your users happy. And so it's kind of a different problem that you have. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of what, what made me make the move. Um, and yeah, I think being in an enterprise environment, you can, there are techniques you can put in place to ensure that you are able to be innovative. And it, when it comes come back to the metrics that Ruth, you discussed that, you know, things like time to market, you know, when we have an idea, how long does that take, you know, to get out to customers and, you know, measuring these things, being, you know, aware of these things and being kind of transparent about, you know, how, how do we improve in different areas? I think that's really important. I think that's, I've really enjoyed that being at Sky, you know, if, if, you know, we all have feedback and we can all be like, okay, how do we improve this process? I felt people listen and that's been really rewarding. Um, so yeah, th there's things like metrics, I think, that you can track. Um, but I think other things we do are like our ways of working. So um, yeah, you could, we, in Innovation AI, we work in um, using Scrum, but throughout the organization, there's, as you said, other agile methodologies or Scrum as well implemented. I think having a regular cadence to deliver um, and trying to think about what is the smallest thing we can deliver rather than just focusing on like requirements is a really important thing and helps us just deliver something useful fast. So I think there's just techniques we can employ that help um, and the culture is you know, top down and bottom up, bottom up. You want people who, who want to build stuff and want to get things out to customers. So I think, yeah, there's lots of factors. I think, um, you know, you know, Sky or large enterprise can learn from startups, but can also just create themselves to encourage innovation. I'm sure you're a strong voice in that and the knowledge that you've brought and the ways of working from a startup. And by the way, a small plug, anybody at home who's considering a career at Sky, we've got amazing opportunities across group products <laughs> and data and technology. <laughs> and I think, you know, Sophia, what you just said, I'm personally also the reason why I joined the company. So you can actually have a big impact and certainly somebody who works with data, you'll have, uh, it's gonna excite you to have that huge amount of data to, to work yeah, with. And, absolutely, and yeah, that, come join. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Good, so um, let's talk a little bit, I mean, I wanna go back to Christina, the, the points that you mentioned. So we've discussed the ingredients of innovation. I'd love to talk also about the hurdles and the impediments and what stop companies from innovating. Ruth, should we start with you? Sure. Well, so, so I'll, I'll come at it a little differently. I, I think some of it is around having groups that aren't BAU. That, well, so actually, let me backtrack. Innovation comes from everywhere within the company. It's not any particular group. But I think it's also giving certain groups a little bit of freedom to move away from the BAU. So to flip that on its head, I think then you have to create these environments so that people can have that ability to sort of ideate uh, have time to do that. You know, you do Labs Week. We at Comcast do Lab Week. So I think some of those things are the positive, but to flip them on the head is to not allow people the time or the environment um, or the leadership that supports that. You know, even just going back to failing. You know, we want to encourage failing fast, but that it's okay, that there's going to be some something that may not go somewhere. So those are just a few, but they're, they're the ante of what we already talked about. Yeah. 
And you mentioned time as one of them, and I've seen many of the people, managers, and heads of in the audience here. How do you concretely do that? Do you just plan it into the sprints? Do you get the justification from your leadership for that? And, and also, in a way, the budget and permission. Yeah. It's so a very pragmatic <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. So it, in, in Comcast Labs, we're, um, we may or may not be working in sprints, but we're also not writing for – we're not doing the – the good engineering practices that must be done for BAU. So we're not writing for scale or operationalizing. We're not doing code reviews. We're trying to prove out a technology. And then once we've done that, we'll work to hand it off to another part of the business who will who will then employ that. So it does give a little bit of freedom in terms of acting like a startup, being a little bit small and scrappy, and really focusing on one objective, which is really to answer a question from a technology perspective. Um, and then once that's done, then we can look at what does it take to, to deploy it. So it does give a little bit of, you know, a little bit of freedom to not have those other things forced on, on you and, you know, come to that resolution and then move forward with it. Christina, what oh, about? Oh, sorry, go for it, no, Sophia. No, I was going to add that. I think I was just discussing with a colleague out, out there about, about this. And I think, you know, innovation is really, it can happen across the organization. Um, and, you know, we need, it's, it's about empowering your employees, really. And I think, you know, that they have the space and the time. We have like Blue Sky Fridays or things like that, spaces where you can just explore a technology or explore an idea. Um, and you will kind of, given that allowance and that's totally fine and, and that's this, that, that's encouraged and I think that's so important and that's I think one of the key things that can help innovation throughout the organization but also yeah innovation might look completely different so if you're kind of on a UI team or focusing on UI or UX that might look really different to say more back-end ML models which might have a really like simple API schema or something that doesn't really update but it might be really cutting edge the next thing you deploy but that's all, so it's, it looks really different, I think, across the organization. It might be processes that you're innovating, it could be anything, but I think it's, yeah, you know, innovation means lots of things. I think it's encouraging all of that and giving the time. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. Yeah. So, yeah. And do you think at Sky we have that permission? And if you had an ask for all of us, what would you? No, would I, you I think we more? really do. And I think that's really important um, that we do. Um, I know in my part of the organization, yeah, we have this kind of Blue Sky Fridays um, and there's hackathons we set up as well. So that's more organized, um, but still kind of chaotic, which is fun. I think it makes it good. It's how it should be. You can kind of experiment, try new things. But yeah, you're really encouraged, I think, to, to try new technologies. If you have an idea, you know, you're encouraged to share that with the team, your product owner, um, see if that can be done, you know, especially if it, it often just adds value or is something that might not be seen by other people. It's um, kind of from a development perspective, I think that's interesting because it's you know, just, you know, it's not just about the requir you know, requirements, it's about how do you build the product as a collaboration. I think that's exciting. That's what I enjoy here. Yeah. Christina, anything you want to add? Well, I think... There must be hurdles one, also in your area. <laughs> one of the biggest threads are fear. I think that this is the one that can derail an innovation project at any point. Is the, is the personal fear that may impact your career if it doesn't go well? Is the team fear that then they may not deliver on time and they have co-shared responsibility in something bigger than them? Is the CFO f fear of investing in something that maybe was not the right thing? Is, is, is there's fear everywhere that, that you have to be comforting without having it all under control. Uh, and, and I think that this is, is really, really the biggest, the biggest challenge for, for making innovation in, in a team. And I like, thank you. And I like, Sophia, what you mentioned about the collaboration. I think it came through in all of the different, uh, different answers you gave. Um, you must also encourage the kind of sharing of information and democratizing information. And that plays back into maybe fear, fear of failure, fear of being recognized personally for your success. So that's something that um, we've also learned in our area and I personally have learned. How do you ensure that everybody feels free to share? Maybe you couldn't take the idea further, but your colleagues can. Right. And, and how do you have that team feeling around it instead of everybody protecting it? So. And having it see the light of day, ultimately. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. So a question, and I, I sort of started asking you, Sophia, this, but 
is it possible in your view for um, a company like Sky and a very big successful corporate to act like a startup? Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what I was saying was that, you know, I think yes, in many ways, you, you know, obviously you aren't a startup, you know, so it's more about what can you do, what techniques can you employ, um, what strategies can you um, deploy that encourage a creative atmosphere. Um, yeah, as you've mentioned, like risk is a key one. You know, um, as a startup, there's little risk in that you have you often don't really have any customers to disappoint. But in a large enterprise, obviously, you do have that. You have a reputation and a brand. So I think it's about understanding that that's true, but also how are there like incre you know just trying to break it down. I think how can you incrementally um, create solutions that you know. Um, are kind of in line with the, the business strategy, essentially, but also innovate. And I think it's it's just about trying to employ different techniques. You mentioned agile, things like that. I think those have really helped us and like our teams. I think. I love that startup in increments. <laughs> <laughs> it's a marathon, not a sprint, in big companies. Maybe yeah. maybe we can operate as a startup, but should we? I think that there are many startups out there that can play their role, and we can just amplify them. We have the ability to influence the industry. We have the ability to deploy products and services. We have lots of data. So I think we have a different role to play. Doesn't mean you are not a startup or you are slow or you are not innovative. No, no, let's not, let's not get confused. You can still be all that, but assume a bigger role. And this is where I think Sky should be. So partnering with the startup, nourishing them, sharing with them, absolutely. But we can be more for them if we play uh, a, a bigger role. Yeah. I, I would also just add, I, I think it's about employing things that you might in a startup where, where it makes sense. So there's some places where you're going to use a lighter weight process, where you're not going to go heavy on process. When you're deploying to millions of customers, you want the rigorous process in place so that you know, you're not, you're not having to roll back releases and things like that. So I think it's about using some common sense. There are some teams where people wear many hats like you would in a startup, and that's okay. And so I think it's it's not sort of a one-size-fits-all, but rather, you know, using the startup mentality and tactics where it's appropriate. Yeah, I love that. And that goes back into the kind of understanding as a leader where the risks lie. Exactly. Again, as a big company like Comcast and Sky, we're responsible for the security of our customers' information yeah. and scalability and resilience. Yeah. So that can never be compromised. Yeah, Understanding the areas where you can act like a startup exactly. um, and which areas, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Can. Where, yeah, where you can tolerate the risk, it comes back to the yeah. risk, right? Yeah, true. Okay, so this is really a topic close to my heart, and I know also for, for you, we're all women in technology, the importance of diversity in innovation. Um, Sophia, do you want to start with some thoughts around that, yeah. especially since it's machine learning, AI? <laughs> I feel it's a really, really important topic there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I th yeah, it's really important. Um, I think it's for, for a few reasons. Um, the first one I'd say is, you know, it's fair, it's right, that the people that, you know, we have representation from everyone, no matter what your cultural background, what your, what your gender, that we have representation creating these products. And that's because of creativity. When you have different people in a room solving problems, you'll get different solutions. Um, and we at Sky, you know, have millions of customers from many different backgrounds. We should rightly represent those backgrounds, create better products for those people, for our customers. So I think it's kind of, it's fair and that it's, I think it's right fundamentally, but also it's important for us at Sky. It makes business sense that we are working for our customers and doing, you know, doing them justice, essentially doing, you know, building them the best things we can. Um, and yeah, and I think you can do lots of things to, to, you know, at Sky we do lots of things to encourage diversity. For example, there's um, like women in tech at Sky and, you know, multicultural at Sky. There's lots of groups at Sky to, um, to be part of if you join. And I think that can really encourage um, an open environment and a, and a really collaborative environment. And it makes, it makes me feel really comfortable working here. I think that's so important. Um, and I think having people in tech um, women in tech and um, diversity in tech is really important as role models because you know 
the next, you know, people looking for those careers can say, oh, like, they look like me, I could do that. And I think that's a really big factor as well. So, yeah, really, really important, I think. Yeah. I can, I'll, I'll chime in. I think the risk of not having diversity, you, yeah, you see it in examples today with machine learning, with computer vision models that have not been trained on diverse populations. So the risk of not having diversity uh, when you're actually forming teams I think it's just too too great. Uh, the, the downside is is incredible. Yeah, but is, is diversity under every single angle? Is diversity in backgrounds, in um, life experience? It could be in the education, in the way of working. Is is diversity really really at the extreme? I think I, I'm a believer, and I have seen examples through my career where the most brilliant ideas came sometimes by cross-pollinizing from other areas where you had never, never thought there could be a valuable input. So I think that we should not be narrow-minded in the fact that you have to be a scientist or you have to be an expert in media. No, actually not. I think that diversity needs to mean many, many different things. That's true, and that's why I know all of you have been also been part of Labs Week and mm -hmm. Comcast. You also run a similar format. I think we might have copied actually Labs Week <laughs> yeah. from Comcast, but that sort of seeks to not in the everyday and leading the teams and putting the teams together, but also it's a kind of real example of when you bring those kind of people yeah. and you connect them. It's it's amazing the kind of Absolutely. ideas we've brought from that uh, forward. Good. We have a few minutes, so I'd love to take some questions. I'm going to switch the iPad from my analog reading cards here. Um, I'll take a few questions that are being posted on Slido. So if anybody from home or your other office wants to post something, feel free. And then also, if there's time, we'll take some questions from the room. Um, OK, this is an interesting, very sort of uh, fundamental. Can innovation be taught, or is it something that you're born with? Who wants to have a go at I that? I think it can be encouraged. <laughs> encouraged. <laughs> I, would, I would reframe it a little bit to say you know, the things that we've talked about, the right environment, the right leadership, all of those things can, can foster it. Um, and I, I think anyone can be innovative. That, that was a good choice of a word. I wouldn't have said inspired. Uh, I, I think that it's something where at many, many occasions you have seen a reference that has inspired you. So, so nothing that you are born alone with, I would say, mm -hmm. but something that, that really wakes up something in you. Yeah, um, I'd say that, yeah, I think innovation is probably, you know, it's probably both. I think some people naturally may be, you know, really creative. There's probably that. But there's also, yeah, I agree, it can be encouraged for sure. And I think when you have people in your teams who... Um, you know, our role models for that, you know, that also is quite infectious. It can rub off on lots of other teammates who maybe are, you know, quieter or something like that. I think it can really, it, it, yeah, it can be taught, it can be encouraged, it can be, you know, grown in a team, I think, yeah. yeah. And there's probably things to add also from our Skylabs journeys. One, people play a different role in different stages of innovation, so it doesn't mean that you're not an innovator if you don't come up with the idea. Maybe you're the one who polishes it off or is able to take it to the next step. And I guess the other thing is going back to diversity, but also accessibility. Um, people operate in different ways, so you can't expect somebody to have the courage to stand up and, and sort of make a big <laughs> big announcement and, a, and communicate their idea. How do we enable people to submit those ideas in, in different formats that, um, you know, caters to the different accessibility needs of in, individuals? Now, this is something, Ruth, that you were already talking about. Do you feel it's important to ensure feedback is given to employees about their innovations, even if that is a no? I think I know the answer to this. But <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, again, I, I do think there's, there is always something to learn from, from any idea, any, any concept, any, any body of work. And that's so right, isn't it? The reframing of it as a learning, I think, is the way you deal with you know, projects that don't succeed in their original sense. You know, you've learned so much by trying it out, and that will then change what you do next. So it will lead to a more productive, better product the next time around. So, yeah, that's great. And I, I would just add, I think it's also encouraging that we need a lot of ideas to have the best ideas come to life. Yeah. So there has to be some that are no. 
if you're really, you know, getting the volume that you want to make sure that the best is rising to the top. Yeah. And Christina, in your department, how do you let the teams down nicely and <laughs> do you give them the feedback and how do you do it? Yes, we had different different uh, proposals and discussions on how it could we be more innovative and push the business. And actually, I, I very much believe we need to link these ideas coming from the teams to the group strategy. So we need to find ways to, to send it upstream. M many of them may not fully fit the business model, but some of them can really uh, open and actually enable others' ideas. Uh, so I very much believe in that. There's, there's that, that uh, kind of motto that says, um, uh, uh, you should like uh, fail fast and quick, uh, and I added something I s and try again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so don't get discouraged. Doesn't matter. I mean, <laughs> give it a try. And uh, s some people may feel a bit ashamed of sharing. They will think it's ridiculous, and nobody will will listen. You know what? <laughs> I mean, if you don't try, you will never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also what we do at labs, and I know you do the same thing at Comcast, we store those ideas. You want to also create, maybe it was also the time wasn't right, or it was you know, just not at this moment, or our product portfolio didn't need this to be applied. So when you've got that kind of wealth of ideas and things that have been taken already forward, um, somebody can tap into that. And again, democratizing information and data and making that accessible. You mentioned something there really, really important, which is the time. I, I said many, many occasions, it's not so difficult to get the what right. When you are, when we are in the, in the research environment and so on, the what is coming, okay, I think that we can get pretty, pretty good guess. Where most people are failing is on the time. Some get too early and, and you don't, especially on a startups, you don't survive to the moment that the market is ready, some get too late and it's not even worth trying. So I believe in the world of innovation, getting the timing right yeah. is quite essential. Yeah, definitely. So I'd like to open up also to the room. We've got a bunch more of online questions. Um, I don't know if somebody's walking around with a microphone and if there's, a, if there's one hand over there, sorry, I need to <laughs> look through the light. Yeah, just, just <laughs> speak up. It's not and a huge We can problem. repeat the question. So working to the panelists uh, between you and the um, can you tell us what you think the most innovative thing you are working on now is, if you can speak about it, and how is it exciting to the consumer as well as to Sky? I can give you a high-level hint. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to measure my words here. <laughs> Actually, um, I think the, the most innovative thing is to put data at work. We have gone through major transformations in, in the company over the last few years. And I think that right now we have building blocks which are incredibly powerful to deliver personal experience, new experience to the consumers that would have not been possible before if it wasn't because of data and because of machine learning and artificial intelligence which are able to get you to a level of a scale and automation that was inimaginable. So I think that along these lines there are very, very nice things in proof of concept right now. I actually think she covered it, and I'm not <laughs> taking that as a way out, but it, it really is true. The building blocks of technology are here like they've never been here before to really, really do some amazing things for the customer. Yeah, I think um, oh, a huge range of things, but I think, yeah, some I probably can't speak about, but um, in terms of the techniques that we use as well, I think, you know, there's so much out there now from a machine learning perspective that is open source, easy to access, you know, means you don't need to be an absolute expert in every part of machine learning to deploy a solution easily. Um, if, and, and I think that just makes it so much easier to build products that you know, are much more cutting edge. Um, 
yeah, I think also just in terms of then how do we apply that interactivity we're working on um, for sports and news. I'd really like to say more, but I'm not sure I should. <laughs> so um, I probably should check that. But yeah, I think just how do we engage our customers in our news and sports experiences um, through our apps um, and through voice on, on TV. So yeah, um, I think those are a few things for me. We're almost out of time, but I want to finish with a very quick question. So quick answers only. What's the advice you'd give your younger selves? Because that's always a nice one to finish up with. Christina, you first. Um, dream high. Don't, don't, don't. I think that for many years, uh, I didn't see the full possibilities in front of me. Okay. Emma, that? Yeah, I, I would say take, take risk. I'd agree, actually. Yeah, take risk and say yes to things, opportunities. Yeah. yeah. Courage and curiosity. Courage. Yeah. <laughs> Be brave. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's a wonderful way to wrap up. I'd like to thank all of you for joining today. Hopefully, it's been an inspirational session for everybody in the room. And uh, enjoy the rest of the, the tech summit and the day. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>